Justin Good, and Thomas Costin, the acting director of the Yale Substance Abuse Treatment Unit in New Haven, Connecticut. Subcommittee on National Security uh, will come to order. We're delighted to uh, have Mayor Wilson Good be the lead-off witness for us. But before we begin our oversight hearing on drug abuse treatment, uh, I know at least one other member would like to make a couple of comments. Here in the midst of a national emergency about uh, drug abuse, uh, we are gathered here to examine the priorities and the strategy. And the important question, of course, is how much treatment is available uh, in our cities? How much education? What are our prevention strategies? And that's what we're here to talk about. The second question that, Im that is important to me is how can the federal government be more sensitive to the needs of everyone at the local level? And in addition, uh, we're very much concerned about whether or not there can be a pass-through of federal funding directly uh, to the large cities who have a uniquely different kind of experience. We're also concerned about the treatment to women. Uh, how are they, uh, whose numbers are rising in terms of drug addiction, uh, what kind of treatment modalities are available to them? And finally, from my point of view, we're very deeply concerned about the validity of treatment modalities for crack and cocaine itself. Uh, I have been very disturbed about the fact that there are very few uh, uh, treatment modalities that are working, even methadone is being questioned with, with, in terms of heroin addiction. And we don't find too many grants coming from uh, the National Institutes of Health, uh, which would encourage our scientists and our medical leaders to really come up with something that works. And so if we're in a national effort, it seems to me the best thing we can do is look at how these two million people could be handled that want to come off of drugs in the United States of America. Let me now turn to uh, Mr. Kyle uh, for any opening comments that he may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a uh, statement which I'd like to submit for the record. Without objection, and so uh, secondly, express the regrets of the ranking member, Mr. Horton, for his inability to be here today. Uh, third, I'd like to say that I am looking forward to the testimony of these witnesses. I think all points of view are useful to us as we engage in our decision-making process. I do want to express regret that there are no administration witnesses here today. I think it would be useful to have their point of view presented in a timely way at the same time that critics of the administration have made uh, are, are making their statements to us. Uh, I, I regret that there is a suggestion that um, uh, there is a gap between the, the uh, administration's rhetoric and its policies. Uh, if we're going to make allegations like that, it seems to me that the administration ought to be represented here to defend itself. Uh, second point I'd like to make is that I think you uh, are very correct, Mr. Chairman, in, in your written statement uh, in bringing attention to the fact that there is a serious lack of research on what works and what it costs. Uh, and. Uh, point out the need, as you say, that it, the federal government must determine priorities for funding, and right now we don't have some of the information that that takes. I would point out that uh, the President proposed last year an amendment to Chapter 6A of the Public Health Service Act, which would require states to develop plans and assure the effective use of uh, treatment resources. The Congress uh, failed to pass that legislation on to the President for his signature. Now it's a year later. And I submit that one of the reasons we don't have some of the necessary research to know what kind of treatment works is that Congress has been remiss in adopting this legislation. Uh, as you know, Mr. Chairman, this legislation would, in six specific ways, require states to adopt uh, information and um, uh, research that would tell us what kind of programs do work and better enable the federal government to allocate its resources to those areas that are effective in drug treatment. I very much hope that Congress can adopt this legislation early in this session. 
and for his signature so that we can get on about the uh, problem uh, or so solving the problem that, uh, that you pointed out in your opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank my friend for his opening statement, fine opening statement. Uh, but let's, let's keep these hearings friendly. Uh, we're going to bring up administration witnesses after this hearing. It would have been uh, totally unworkable. We'd have been here all day if we tried to combine these witnesses with the administration. So I want to assure the gentleman from Arizona that there will be administration witnesses testifying on the same subject. Uh, I'd now like to recognize the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Barbara Boxer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to congratulate you on these hearings. This is the Legislation and National Security Subcommittee and anyone who is alive today knows that probably the biggest threat to our national security is what's happening to our young people, what's happening uh, with the drug problem. And uh, surely it's, it's greater than any external threat that we now face. So this is very appropriate for your committee. Let me just say, uh, and you and I discussed this uh, before, that in my capacity as chair of the health task force over at the budget committee, we've been looking at the NIH grants, and what we've learned is quite shocking. And that is that the administration is funding only one quarter of the approved grants for NIH. And Mr. Chairman, it is even worse than that. Uh, even with that small approval rating, uh, because of budgetary pressures, uh, many of these grantees are being told that their grants are being downgraded. So let's say you did receive a grant to study the impact of certain drugs uh, you will probably get a knock on your door and, and you're told now that next year, although you were going to re receive $25,000, you are now going to receive $15,000. So we've got a major problem on our hands within NIH. I'm hoping the Budget Committee is going to move with you in this particular area. But again, I, I'm very anxious to, um, to hear the witnesses and to take part in this hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our first witness is the Honorable Wilson Good, the mayor of the city of Philadelphia since 1983, an old friend of mine, and uh, who is also here in perhaps a couple capacities. Mr. Chairman, it is even worse than that. Uh, even with that small approval rating, uh, because of budgetary pressures, uh, many of these grantees are being told that their grants are being downgraded. So let's say you did receive a grant to study the impact of certain drugs. Uh, you will probably get a knock on your door, and, and you're told now that next year, although you were going to re receive $25,000, you're now going to receive $15,000. So we've got a major problem on our hands within NIH. I'm hoping the Budget Committee is going to move with you in this particular area. But again, I, I'm very anxious to, um, to hear the witnesses and to take part in this hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our first witness is the Honorable Wilson Good, the mayor of the city of Philadelphia since 1983, an old friend of mine, and uh, who is also here in perhaps a couple capacities. In addition to his experience as a mayor of the fifth or fifth largest city in, in the United States, uh, he is also co-chair of the United States Conference of Mayors Drug Control Task Force, and in addition, he's chairman of the Conference of Mayors AIDS Task Force and serves on the Human Development Committee of the National League of Cities. He's a professional city manager by experience, and uh, we, we are very pleased that you could join us uh, in the beginning of the examination of how we in Congress can be more sensitized to the problems uh, uh, in our urban communities. Welcome, Mayor Good. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to come before you to represent, of course, my own city, but also to represent the U.S. Conference of Mayors to discuss a major crisis we are facing as a nation, the crisis of drug abuse and inadequate treatment resources. Today we are in the midst of one of the most critical periods in our history. Our future is threatened by drugs in our homes, on our streets, and in our communities. Our cities are being infected 
and affect it socially, medically, and financially. In Philadelphia, we have experienced the brutal reality of the drug crisis. Narcotics arrests have increased by 89 percent since 1980, while admissions to treatment programs for cocaine abuse have increased from 117 in 1980 to 10,329. Let me repeat that. Admission to drug treatment programs for cocaine abuse have increased from 117 in 1980 to 10,329 at the end of 1989. I have five major points regarding federal anti-drug funding that I wish to impress upon you today. The first deals with the need for a much greater federal commitment to the war on drugs. Let me be clear that we welcome the assistance provided by the federal anti-drug bill. However, $10.2 billion is simply not enough to have a meaningful impact across the entire nation. Let me indicate that this number pales in comparison to at least $50 billion or perhaps as much as $250 billion to be spent on rescuing the savings and loans. We need to demonstrate a similar degree of commitment to enable us to wage a real war on drugs. One of the primary indicators of the magnitude of the problem and one which should serve as a barometer for the degree of additional federal assistance needed is the length of the waiting list of those wishing to enter treatment programs. In Philadelphia, total waiting list time, total waiting list is now 500, a figure which does not include those who have decided it is not even worth trying to get into a program. The cost of the length of the waiting list and the overall inadequacy of the resources, sometimes difficult decisions must be made in terms of deciding who should be a priority for treatment. While every case is an individual one and must be treated as such, I have directed that the most vulnerable among those who can help, namely pregnant women and women with young children, should be given first preference. Also, young people seeking help who are moved into treatment as quickly as possible. To deal with this current set of difficulties, I believe we must provide a dramatic expansion of treatment opportunities, especially residential services. While initial costs will be great, the long-term benefits to the individuals themselves and society as a whole will be even greater. We also need to recognize that there are segments of the community in need of additional specialized services, especially pregnant women and women with children, Hispanics and youth, as well as groups of substance abusers with specific problems, such as homeless and IV drug users with AIDS, all of these require the type and degree of assistance that can only come from the federal government. As my second point, I want to strongly urge a more equitable balance between the supply and demand sides of the anti-drug equation. We cannot continue to maintain a policy that directs only three of every 10 federal anti-drug dollars to treatment and prevention programs. Despite the massive amount of federal law enforcement dollars already provided, the problem is not improving. We are at a point today where many law enforcement officers, including my own police commissioner, have stated that they want additional resources aimed at curbing demand. In addition, a more even distribution a resources would enable, would enable us to determine which treatment programs are the most effective. There really is no clear way to determine effectiveness without a greater 
portion of federal resources being made available for treatment. At present, we gauge the success of programs by a variety of means, such as attrition rates, return to educational institutions, job placement, and others. We clearly need a more formal and systematic approach, an approach not really possible under current fiscal constraints. My third point deals with the need for a direct pass-through of federal funds to larger cities. With the passage of the 1986 Anti-Drug Abuse Act, the Philadelphia Drug and Alcohol Service System did receive a much-needed infusion of resources to help maintain the existing treatment and prevention system. In addition, new resources were used to expand our capabilities to respond to the a, expanded areas of need, such as cocaine abuse, communities in crisis, substance abuse with pregnant women with children, homeless substance abusers, and AIDS and IV drug users. However, the treatment and prevention components of the Act, as well as those of the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1988, have not been totally responsive to all of our needs. During the initial debate on this bill, and on many subsequent occasions, my colleagues and I strongly argued for a direct funding provision to the cities. We stated then, and I still believe, that cities have a better chance on dealing with this problem if we are funded directly. Let me just make the point here, not in my notes, that part of the problem is that when you fund the states, they have to take and spread those dollars throughout the entire state. That makes political good sense. We believe that the problem is not evenly distributed throughout the states, and therefore that the cities with the worst problem, with the most concentrated drug problem, should be targeted in order to receive those funds. If that happens, we believe that we have a better chance of maximizing the use of federal dollars to ensure that we can, at least with those dollars that we have, make more of an impact upon drug problems. Nonetheless, the Act solely authorized allocation to, to, to the states. As a result, they have had limited impact on my cities and cities across this country. Since a major portion of the funds have been allocated on the basis of priorities established by the states and not on local priorities determined by local authorities. In addition, initial distribution of funds to the cities for treatment took much longer than the urgency of the problem dictated it should have taken. Uh, in Philadelphia, for instance, we had to wait 18 months for our first share of federal funds. Today, I'm happy to say that, that the time frame will apparently be cut in half, but we still believe that direct funding would permit even quicker provision of funds, as well as allowing for much more direct local involvement in deciding on how those funds will be used. However, if direct local funding still is not adopted, as my fourth point, I would advocate that large cities be granted the flexibility needed to respond to the drug crisis based upon their own particular experiences and insights. I understand that some in the federal government support the notion of comprehensive state planning, a belief which leads them to conclude, incorrectly in my opinion, that cities need to strictly fall within the policy and decision-making constraints of the state. I would submit, however, that effective comprehensive state planning could still occur if cities had more prerogatives and decision-making capacity. In fact, the plans would reflect a more realistic course of action if greater flexibility granted, were granted to the cities. One, one precise recommendation that I would make in this regard is to provide cities the option of using a greater share of federal resources for capital projects. It is simply not sound policy when operating resources are not able to be put to immediate use because of structural and often and other capital-related problems. 
in, in their current facilities. On the current policy, we're passing up the chance to obtain maximal utilization of federal resources in ways that will do the most good. My fifth and last point deals with the need for a more comprehensive treatment program. In many ways, I'm calling for a new way to look at drug treatment. In addition to expanding the clinical components of the treatment, we need to make what were formerly called auxiliary services an integral part of a revised system of treatment, job training, literacy programs, child care, intensive programs for children whose parents who are receiving treatment, parenting skill classes, all must be added to the constellation of existing programs. It is clear that individuals participating in drug treatment programs often have a variety of problems, such as inadequate parenting abilities, low literacy and unmarkable or minimal job skills, all of which are contributing factors to our result of drug abuse. To make genuine and permanent progress, individuals must be given the opportunity to overcome these and other problems. In addition to being a humane course of action, I believe the present and future societal costs arising from these problems can be reduced in a significant way by a more comprehensive treatment services. Before I conclude, I want to address an issue that I have testified on in the past, a very bad idea that some very smart people are lending their support to. I refer, of course, to the idea of legalizing drugs, or as, as said by others, the study of this question. Let me state that, for the record, that this would be the worst domestic policy decision we as a nation could make, bar none. Such, as an, such an omission of defeat would result in greater use of drugs, as well as set an entirely inappropriate moral tone and climate within which to raise our children. Recently, our city council proposed examining this issue. I was the first one to oppose it, and probably the loudest one as well. In the end, they wisely saw the error of their thinking and concluded that just yes was no answer at all. And I make the point because I think there are too many people who are very smart who are beginning to try and find quick answers to this problem. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, we, we must come to grips with the fact that the real solution to the drug problem lies in education and prevention for those not yet lost to drugs. It lies in treatment for those now addicted. It lies in increased economic and social opportunities, the lack of which create a sense of despair and hopelessness that makes drug pushing lucrative and drug taking a quick escape from the pain of reality. Philadelphia, like cities across this nation, is a victim of the drug problem. Although we are developing measures to deal with the immediate symptoms of the problem, we do not have enough resources to successfully eradicate the spread of drug use and abuse. Just as the federal government is committed both in personnel and economic power to the defense of this nation, it must also be committed in the same way to the defense of this nation from illegal use and sale of drugs. The signs of our times signal that the most fearful destruction of this country will not come from armies across the seas, will not come from political tyrannies across the borders. Our most fearful destruction will come from physical and mental deterioration from within, the destruction of our young people and our children. This destruction of our future due to drug abuse and crime. 
we're losing an entire generation of young people at the rate that we're going. Unless there is a greater commitment from the federal level, unless there is adequate funding to needed areas, we as a nation, in spite of our current efforts, will face even more difficult days ahead. Mr. Chairman, I submit that we have the means to win the war on drugs. We have the commitment of our communities, but we must have the commitment of the most powerful government in this world, our federal government. Thank you for being here, and I now will be pleased to answer your questions, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mayor Wilson, good. You've given us a very powerful and thoughtful message based on a lot of experience. Uh, <clears throat> I thank you very much. Have you or your experts in law enforcement led you to any conclusions about the, uh, the vindictive streak that you frequently uh, find in the national legislature, which wants to deal with the drug problem through lengthiest sentences, mandatory minimums, building more prisons, and bringing back the death penalty? What, what uh, can you tell us uh, in that connection? I, uh, I can tell you, Mr. Chairman, that, uh, that it is not a difficult problem to see why many people throughout the nation look first at law enforcement. And in fact, the U.S. Conference of Mayors has adopted as its top priority to take back the streets from the drug pushers. Because the most visible sign of the drug problem is on the street corners of our cities. And therefore, what mayors uh, have to do is protect their citizens as a first priority and to return the streets to some degree of safety for those who live and work in our cities. However, all of us know that this is a short-term measure that will never, under any circumstances, solve the drug problem long-term. And therefore, as we put a major part of our resources into taking back our streets and restoring orders uh, to our cities, uh, we at the same time understand that without prevention, without education, and without treatment on demand, uh, we will never solve the drug problem. And I use the term treatment on demand because anyone who is caught up on this drug problem must be able to get off. We believe, uh, mayors believe, that we have to have the ability to give to every single person who wants to receive treatment, treatment. In Philadelphia today, we can treat only three out of four people who come to us, uh, a, a 25 percent must wait and wait and wait and wait until resources come along. And for some of them, it's too late because, they are, because they, those people who are waiting to, to receive treatment end up uh, robbing, end up stealing and burglarizing uh, uh, people, snatching purses, and sometimes end up in jail uh, while they're waiting to receive treatment. Uh, we believe in the end uh, that only if we have treatment on demand uh, and, and specialized, uh, specialized care system uh, can we in any way start to alleviate the drug problem facing our cities. Uh, Mayors will continue to fight for more enforcement dollars because we need to have the ability to take back our streets. But we are smart enough to understand that is, at best, a very, very short-term measure. And a long-term impact, and I'm summarizing that, the long-term impact must come from investment in prevention, education, and I believe the critical part of that is in treatment itself on demand. Well, you're reflecting the experience of uh, someone who is working right down 
in the real world on this problem. And I, I thank you very much for your very focused view on the subject. Mr. John Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mayor Good, I'd like to compliment you on a very fine statement and also for your leadership efforts in this uh, in the and uh, particularly uh, uh, compliment you for the uh, strong statement you made against legalizing drugs. I think it, uh, as the chairman said, takes people like you who are on the front line, who have experience with it on a day-to-day -day basis, to help bring some, some rational uh, experience to the debate. And uh, drug legalization is not the answer, as you've pointed out. And I appreciate your statement on that. Let me just ask you a, a couple of questions about the specific points of, of your testimony. One of the things you indicated was that more formal and it, we need a more formal and systematic approach to getting information on what works. And I, I gather, therefore, that you're supportive of the legislation that passed the House and Senate but was never put into final form and sent on to the President last year. I alluded to it in my opening statement. The legislation that would actually set up a system for information gathering at the state level so that we could better determine how to prioritize the uh, allocation of the federal uh, resources. Do you, do you agree with that? Yes, I do. Uh, I believe it is very, very important that we collect every bit of information that we can on what works and what does not work. Uh, what is clear to, to, to me and to other mayors around the country is that we do not yet have the real answer on what treatment programs work. And until we have those real answers, then we're all going to be out there groping trying to find a solution to the problem. And every single day, we're losing people. Uh, they're casualty of war. Uh, people who are lost in this drug war, who are killed on our street corners, who die from drug over, uh, 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 overuse, uh, who, who die because they uh, can't find a way, are, are people literally who are caught up uh, in, in, in this war and a casualty of the war. And uh, there are people around my city who are now beginning to, to, to put up monuments to these people because we're losing them every single day on our street corners. And, uh, and my point is, yes, we have to find a way uh, by research, uh, by a well-documented funded program to be able to find out what works and what does not work. Mr. Mayor, you just alluded to something that I, I, I find fascinating, and that is that people in the neighborhoods or in the communities are actually setting up monuments to, to victims of, of this drug uh, yes. uh, scourge. I, I think that's um, um, fundamental to the ultimate solution, is to have the people in the local communities care. And I know that's part of the reason why you've suggested that cities uh, need these resources to make the programs work. But let me ask you about the difficulty that we have of allocating resources at the federal level. What, what gives you confidence, based upon uh, what I know would be your contention that we've not responded adequately in the past, we the Congress, um, what gives you confidence in the federal legislature um, being able to more equitably and properly allocate these admittedly scarce resources um, than the states to whom the monies are, are currently awarded? And you, you've argued that it should be directly from the Congress rather than to the states. What, what gives you greater confidence that Congress can make those decisions, not only allocating among the various states, but also the communities within the state, um, than the current system where, whereby it's done through the state legislatures? We have had experiences in the past, I believe, uh, with programs like Model Cities, uh, where Congress uh, has had the ability to target uh, dollars to where the problems uh, were the worst. Uh, and I believe uh, that as you look around this country at the problems of drug use, of drug abuse, of illegal drug sales in our urban areas, is with that question the worst. Uh, and therefore, I don't think it would take much of a research uh, on the part of Congress to be able to go out and to determine that the dollars uh, are not going where the problems are the worst. Secondly, when you put money into a state, uh, the governor and the state houses and state senators of those states will have to necessarily spread those dollars politically throughout the state. Uh, and because you have those persons from various parts of those states, small communities have to get their share of those dollars. 
even though they may not have a drug problem at all, they have to have some of those dollars. That is not making use of what are now meager resources coming out of the Federal Government. And with only $10.5 billion being spent, uh, it seems to me that uh, we ought to make the most of those dollars, and the most can be made, in my view, by having flexibility of the use of those dollars. And it cannot be done if we're spreading it to every small community across uh, these states, but it can only be properly utilized if, in fact, they're targeted where the problems are. I, I appreciate your answer. I'm sure you'd agree that some of the mayors of the small communities uh, would argue with that. And all I would say is that Congress has been known to inject a little politics into how we distribute funds, too. I don't believe that too. at all, sir. <laughs> uh, Mr. Mayor, let me ask you something else. You've, you've worked with your state legislature in, in, uh, in receiving the funds from the state. Uh, have you been able to utilize all of the funds that the, that the state of Pennsylvania has made available to the city of Philadelphia? Yes, we utilize the dollars as the dollars flow to us. Uh, Sometimes we find, as I mentioned in my uh, direct testimony, uh, that it takes sometime 18 months. Sometime uh, our fiscal year starts on July 1st. Sometime it's the next uh, February or March or April before dollars start to flow to us. And so you run into a problem when you have that. So the answer to your question is yes, we find it difficult to have the dollars flow on an even basis throughout the fiscal year. Well, uh, how would that be any better if, the, if that money came from the federal government? Uh, it, would, it, it would really, frankly, take out one additional bureaucratic step. Rather than funding uh, the state, who then must fund the cities, then we only have one bureaucracy to work with, which is, which is the federal government at that point. My understanding is that for the last three years, Philadelphia has, has had to turn money back in. That is to say, it hasn't utilized the full allocation. It was some I don't believe six, that. or excuse me, eight hundred thousand dollars last year. Is that not correct? That's not correct. Uh, uh, and if it is correct, it's only because we could not get the money uh, on time, not because we could not use it. E even if that's been for three years in a row. Uh, again, I, I, I make the point which I've given to you, and the point is, is that the problem is in having the money flow to us on a timely basis, that we can spend the money within the given time frame. I can assure you, sir, that we can spend every single cent that is given to us and double that amount and three times or four times that amount of money. On the question of treatment on demand, um, you indicated that you can only treat three out of four um, of the people who come to you for treatment. Um, what, do you know what percentage in, in rough terms uh, of the people are able to pay for all or part of their treatment as opposed to that which is provided free? I'm sorry, sir. Do, do you know what percentage of the people that come before you for treatment are able to pay for all or part of it a, as opposed to those who obtain it free? Not a precise number, but I can tell you that the large percentage, I'm talking now in the 80, 85 percent number, uh, cannot pay, cannot pay. Uh, the, the, there are nationwide statistics that, uh, that indicate that about 55 percent of the uh, private facilities are, are open and, and available. And obviously, if you can match up those people who can pay for a program with the private facilities which have vacancies currently, that's a way to help make up part of this, uh, uh, part of this number who aren't uh, getting treatment today. I, 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 spent, I spent last summer uh, uh, in a mobile office, and I traveled around the city uh, and went to the 25 worst drug corners in my city. And I talked firsthand uh, to people who had been drug abusers, who were drug abusers. And, and in almost every single street corner I went to, people came up to me and said, we need treatment programs, we need some way to get off of this train. Uh, I got caught up in this by mistake, and now I need something that works. We have more than 60 neighborhood anti-drug groups working as well. Their number one plea to me, and when they talk with me and meet with me, is, Mr. Mayor, we need more facilities for treatment. We can't help the people who are coming to us 
because we don't have the facilities, we don't have the programs. I can tell you from a first-hand point of view, the problem is real. The people out there can't afford to pay their way. They don't have money. They are the same people that uh, have caused our crime rate to increase in our cities because, because they can't afford uh, to have treatment program that go out and steal and rob and burglarize in order to receive money to buy drugs to keep the habit going while we're waiting to set a treatment program. I believe firmly if we had some way of dealing with this problem that we could cut uh, the crime rate down, we could reduce our drug problem, uh, but without that, it's not going to work. Well, would and, you we, yeah. Wouldn't you agree we need some kind of central uh, system to direct those people who can afford to pay into those programs that currently are being underutilized and those in that cannot pay go into the, uh, into the programs that we uh, subsidize or, or pay all of the money to support? Uh, Would, wouldn't that be a useful thing for you? I don't think it would be a useful thing in terms of investment of, uh, of, of time. I think that there are, in fact, people out there who or who can afford to go into a uh, treatment program and who use those programs. Uh, I'm trying to make the point, and thus far apparently unsuccessfully to you, sir, is, is that the, the people that I see every single day out there who are the real victims uh, out there, and I, I use the word victims, uh, of this drug war are people who can't afford to pay their way through private drug treatment programs. Uh, and these are people who are, who are caught into impoverished neighborhoods of our cities who simply cannot, cannot afford to pay their way through these programs. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'll come back with my final question. Thank you. Well, you, you, your time was excessive, but your questions were superior. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Kyle. Mrs. Barbara Boxer. Mr. Mayor, how successful are these programs? Are there some models that work better than others? Do the, do the people who go through them stay off the drugs, or do they go right back out on the streets? What's, what's your experience? We don't know enough, in my opinion, to answer that question in a professional manner that would give me confidence that my answer is valid. Uh, we don't know whether or not uh, the programs that we have in place now will guarantee that the people who go through those programs will stay off. And that's why I spent some time in my testimony talking about the need for more information, for more research to determine what works and what does not work. Mm -hmm. And what is clear to me is that if, if we can put a person in a residential program and keep them there for a long period of time and have follow-up counseling to that person, then I think that we will have something that works. Uh, but I don't know. And I have to say to you, I really don't know, and I don't think anyone at this point really knows, uh, and, and perhaps those experts who will come behind me will be able to tell you more about that, but uh, we, we need to, to have more validated information about what works and does not work in terms of drug treatment. But we do need to be about the business of uh, investing more resources in the treatment area. Uh, you'll get no argument from me on that. I appreciate your honesty, and I think the point you make about follow-up has got to be critical. I mean, if you look at the AA programs, uh, those programs really work because people follow up. It becomes a way of life. And if you just don't have a follow-up, it, it seems to me empirically that it, it won't work. Um, I used to be in a local board of supervisors um, in California and had really the, the joy of receiving revenue sharing, which we found to be an excellent program because we were able to decide what our needs were at the local level and we would use, use the revenue sharing for the things that were most important. I'm assuming that you would prefer that kind of a program. And let's say we had a drug abuse revenue sharing program as opposed to the one where it goes through the states that you would appreciate that more maybe based on a certain formula and the problems that are facing the inner cities? Would that be a better type of program? It would be, um, Madam Congresswoman, ideal. However, I think that that is not going to ever happen, but it would be ideal. 
and, and therefore short of that, we're willing to have some targeted dollars with some flexibility so that we can target those dollars towards where the problem is the worst in our cities. Um, my last point has to do with prevention. Um, and I know that my chairman has looked at that issue. Um, it has always been my theory that there are certain incredible people that come out of difficult circumstances in an extraordinary way. They grow up in difficult neighborhoods, difficult lives, and yet something about those people, someone gave them a spark or they have a spark where they manage to make it. And, and I have conceived of, a, of an idea, and it's in the form of a bill I'm working with Pat Williams on, and I just want to bounce it off you for, to get your reaction to, to the concept, if not the detail of it, which is that we, that we look at where our problems are in the high-risk areas of our, of our country, and we know what the high-risk areas are. We don't <clears throat> need any more studies to know that a kid from a, a broken home and a kid from a home where there's drug abuse, alcohol abuse, et cetera, uh, is going to have a, a, t a tougher time making it. And if, we, and if we act early in that child's life, in the early years of school, maybe even fourth grade, third grade, to match that child up with uh, a mentor, but someone who they can relate to, someone who is really making it, growing up in the same community, et cetera, and, and, and take that mentor and pay that mentor more than that mentor would get working at McDonald's because a lot of these kids have to work, and match that person up and give these kids that role model early in life so that we don't get to the point where you're at, where you're standing on corners and we've lost a whole generation really. I mean, and we've got to get them back somehow, but it's a heck of a lot harder. I wonder if you could react um, to that notion and tell me if there's anything happening in the Philadelphia area like that. Will we give this child who's a high-risk child this one-on-one -on -one attention? <coughs> the, the answer to your question is no, I'm not aware of any special program like that. But let me just say also that I think that the concept of intervening in the lives of young people at a very early age is a sound one, and one which I believe will work uh, if we give the young child the kind of guidance and direction they need early on. I believe that we are more apt to have a productive uh, uh, adult than we are if we do not. Uh, the Hit Start program worked. Sure. It worked. Uh, every documentation that you can find proved that it worked. We have now decided uh, to work in Philadelphia in a special project called the Children Network in trying to integrate all of our services dealing with children from, from the ages of zero to six, because we believe that is a critical age to intervene in the lives of those children and to take our current resources and integrate those resources and perhaps put them in one building and try and impact upon the life of that child to enable that child to be all that a child can be in life. Uh, we have to try all of these models if indeed we're going to uh, intervene and, and, and capture and recapture some of our children. Otherwise, what happens to them is they go through life and they're influenced early on by their peers and influenced too much by the culture of the street corners that lead to uh, drug abuse uh, and, and illegal drug sales. And so I think your concept is one which is worth trying. Uh, uh, Big Brothers and Big Sisters, which is a similar program, has worked mm -hmm. for, for many people. And many people will give you testimony that uh, somewhere in their lives that they had someone who came along who took them by the hand and led them in the right direction. And I think a program of professional mentors uh, is a good and sound one, and one which I would encourage that would be tried. Uh, we have to use every, every conceivable notion we can to uh, intervene in the lives of our young people and rescue them, because we're losing them every single day. That's right.
Thank you so much for your eloquent testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mrs. Boxer. Uh, pleased to recognize the ranking member of this committee, the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Glenn English. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mayor Good, uh, I appreciate your testimony, and I think you've made some, some very good points. A uh, couple, though, I think that perhaps we ought to uh, uh, review just a little bit. The drug problem has been with us now for better than 20 years. And throughout that period, we've had study after study. We've had all kinds of different pro uh, programs that have been in place. And I guess I would take issue with you whenever you say that we've got to have more research to determine what works. We may have a lot of programs out there that don't work. I think we've got a lot of shysters, quite frankly, that are in the drug treatment business and uh, with a lot of different programs that, quite frankly, uh, uh, have no chance of working. But as far as not knowing what works, I, I would take issue with that. And I think the experts that come behind you are probably going to take issue with it uh, specifically. We know what works. I would suggest to you the problem is applying what works and applying the knowledge that we have and implementing the programs that we know that what works. Because quite frankly, many times they don't fit within the, the political realities that, uh, that are the political desires that many people have. Uh, you have uh, uh, quite rightly pointed out treatment and education are very important, uh, that uh, law enforcement officials uh, are nearly unanimous, I think, across the country. Those are involved in, in the drug war and saying that that's ultimately what's going to win. But uh, I notice that, uh, that nationally, locally, uh, that's not where the emphasis is placed. It is placed on supply, and uh, uh, that uh, raises an interesting question. Uh, would you uh, would you care to uh, to comment uh, any on whether or not whether we're fighting really a war on drugs or maybe it's a political war on drugs, where in fact we're playing politics with the war on drugs and uh, and the the, uh, the resources, the effort, the attention is focused on those areas that uh, that may uh, generate the greatest amount of uh, of uh, political support among the people of this country. So that. Uh, uh, those of us who are elected officials can stand up and show how tough we are on war on drugs by the number of policemen that are added or uh, the number of, of new uh, uh, pieces of equipment that are added or the amount of new money that may be going into this effort. I would make um, three comments. Uh, one is that I don't think that the drug problem as we know it today is 20 years old. I would take strong exception to that. Uh, I've been in office for six years, uh, and, and if someone had told me six years ago the drug problem would be what it is today, I would have not believed it. Uh, and I don't think that, uh, that, 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 uh, that anyone could have foreseen six years ago that the degree of crisis that we have facing urban America would be where it is today in terms of the drug problem. And there may very well be some experts who will follow me who will say to me and to you up here that they have the answer to how you take someone who is a crack cocaine addict and, and have a precise way of putting that person into a system uh, to, uh, to, uh, to freedom of drug, uh, drug use. I don't know the answer to the question. My response is that the experts which I've talked to uh, uh, have some program which they think work, but no one is quite sure this time. And maybe there are some people who are quite sure. And I'd be pleased to receive from these hearings uh, that testimony. Uh, but let me go to your, uh, your major question, which is, uh, what do I believe? Uh, I believe that too many people uh, are giving lip service to this war on drugs. Uh, I don't believe that we can fight this war with 10.2 or $10.5 billion. Uh, I don't believe uh, that if we had any war anywhere in the world that uh, where we're losing as many people on day by day basis as we're losing on our streets of our cities, that the war would go on without the infusion of major resources to deal with the problem. Now, uh, I don't know whether it's political or not political. All I know is, is that mayors across this country uh, 
uh, all agree that the number one problem facing their city is the illegal sale and use of drugs. And we have to find a way to cope with the problem. Because if we don't find a way to cope with the problem, we're losing our neighborhoods. We're having people barricade themselves in their houses, afraid to come out. Our central business district are being besieged by people who are leaving neighborhoods to come down there and rob our downtown stores uh, in order to get money to buy drugs. Cars parked on the streets have been broken into on a day-by-day -day basis. Radios are ripped out. Anything that they can uh, uh, tape uh, decks are ripped out of those cars. Anything they can rip out to sell or being sold for, that, for those purposes. So from my point of view, the problem is real one. Young people, young people are being killed every single day on our street corners. Uh, in, in, in Philadelphia, in New York, in Boston, in Baltimore, in Washington, in Atlanta, in Los Angeles, in San Francisco, they've been killed every single day. And so far as I'm concerned, that's a war. And, 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 and it's more, more of a war than anything that we find going on anywhere around the world today. And therefore, it seems to me that the most resources should be spent on trying to find a way to stop the killing, to stop the taking of the lives of these people on our street corners. Now, it happens that the major number of people who have been killed are minority young people. And perhaps there's something in that where, where, where those who have the uh, uh, ability to solve it don't have the will to do so. And I hope that somewhere along the line that we will find a way to have the will to deal with that problem. But at this point, all I can say to you is, is that as someone who has spent nights in drug vigils in neighborhoods, someone who has spent uh, days out there on street corners in a mobile office watching drug deals take place, someone who has talked to people in these neighborhoods, that there's a real problem facing American citizens and that the problem is not one which is uh, even five years old. It is two or three years old in terms of severity, as we see it today. And therefore, uh, people who once thought there might be a way to solve this problem are now becoming a little hopeless about how you solve this problem. And I believe that you have to have the effective enforcement. But without treatment, without education, without prevention, will not going to solve the problem. Now, is it political? I don't know. Uh, uh, I know I, I take the Metro Liner down about five or six times every six months to Washington to testify, go to the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and we talk about it over and over again. And yes, we all understand the problem. Uh, but for some reason, we can't seem to get those who list priorities to put this above savings and loans. And I think that we ought to be able to at least have $50 billion. If we can find a way to put $50 billion to rescue savings and loans, can't we put $50 billion to rescue our young people of this city, of, of our country? And, and, and I think that, uh, uh, that certainly, certainly from my point of view, the lives of young people are more important than these buildings and these investors who have money in savings and loans. Mayor, I, uh, I don't disagree with what you're saying, and certainly I don't disagree with the regarding uh, the priority uh, uh, as this again gets back to this political question. On the one hand, we have people who profess to be uh, uh, strongly in support of fighting the war on drugs, but when it comes time to provide the money, I would agree with you that uh, far too often, in fact, nearly always, we found the war on drugs is very low on the priority list. Uh, I noticed by my good friend Mr. Kyle over here uh, when he made the comment that Congress has not responded in the past. I would suggest to you the administration, whether it's this administration or past administrations, have not been too eager in responding to this issue either. And certainly we have not seen the leadership whenever it comes to money uh, of providing those kind of resources. So I, I would agree with you. I'm going to disagree with you on a couple of other points. So again, uh, I would suggest to you the folks in Miami would disagree with you strongly as far as this problem being one that's two or three or four years old. Uh, they had blood running in the streets of Miami ten years ago. And I would suggest to you that the United States military back uh, 12 years ago 
14, 16 years ago was fighting this problem within their forces. So it's, it may be as far as, as your particular city and the emphasis and the impact that it's had, certainly it has shifted as far as this country is concerned from one city to another. And now we find it all across the city. The problem has worsened. There's no question about that. You regard, with regard to your statements on crime, I would wholeheartedly agree with you that uh, the crime is, uh, and certainly the, whether it's people being robbed, uh, whether they're having their property stolen, whatever it may be, uh, there's better than a 50-50 chance these days that that's going to be drug-related, drug-connected. But uh, by the same token, uh, how many of our state prisons today, how many of our city jails, how many of our federal prisons have long-term drug rehabilitation programs tied in so that those people who are drug dependent, who are caught, who are sent to prison, in fact, receive the kind of assistance? You have very little more than just simply a drug detoxification system at best in any prison. So I would suggest to you that on the surface we know that. That's obvious. We know full well that long-term drug rehabilitation programs work. It costs money. It takes time. But uh, the obvious linkage of a person who has been caught of a crime in which they've stolen in order to take care of a habit that they might have and then being sent to prison for a certain period of time where they can get drugs just as easy as they can out on the street. You know that as well as I do. Probably get them in Philadelphia jail as easy as they can out on the street. That's the reality that we're facing. And until we face up to that, until we deal with that, until we, in fact, take charge and provide the kind of, of, of programs that we know work in our prison systems and outside our prison systems for people that are drug dependent, I would suggest to you that we are, in fact, fighting a political war on drugs, not a real war on drugs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank, uh, <clears throat> I want to thank all of uh, my members here on the committee for excellent questions. Unfortunately, we are going to have to uh, release Mayor Good from his obligation today. You, you help us keep hope alive, Mayor Good, because you bring your experience and your determination that we can turn this, this problem around and that we can do a lot better. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Our doctors and experts have been very patient. They're the next panel up. We're going to put uh, Mr. Bestman in with uh, three doctors, Dr. Robert Newman, Dr. Thomas Costin, Dr. Stanley Wallach, and uh, in this committee, gentlemen, we always uh, allow you to make any comments on anything you've heard or thought you heard uh, in the hearing room. All testimony uh, will be reproduced, all written testimony will be reproduced in its entirety for the, uh, the final publication of this hearing. So. Of course, you will uh, be invited to summarize your remarks as, as briefly as possible so that we can uh, ask a few questions of you. Thank you all for coming. And you may begin, Mr. Bestman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm very uh, pleased with this opportunity to appear before you in light of the conversation at the end of uh, the mayor's testimony, I would like to recommend reading to the committee and your staff. And one is a pamphlet that has been put out by the National Association of State Alcohol and Drug Abuse Director called Treatment Works. And I can give this to the committee if you don't already have copies. And the other is the purchase of a book called Drug Abuse Treatment, A National Study of Effectiveness. The N of patients here is about 10,000 patients, and it shows, the, and this is a study that goes back before the crack epidemic, but it shows that all modalities work to some extent, and it's a matter, and these patients were followed five years out. And uh, I would just like to say that the preponderance of evidence for since uh, about the 30s, starting with the Pesker study, is that treatment does work. It's just not infallible. And it's much easier to remember the patient who comes back to us 10 times than the one who only stayed once and left and we never saw again. And, but the data supports the fact that treatment does work. And that's an aside, but I think it's important to put that on the record. Well, I think it's very, very much uh, to the point. And we thank you for the recommendation of the, uh, the literature. And right. 
and we'll, ex we'll accept it. Yeah, I would record. like to concentrate very briefly my remarks on the national strategy as it approaches treatment because it is part of the problem as I see us address the treatment area as a nation. To start off with, the strategy f flatly and inadequately addresses the difference between use, abuse, and addiction. It almost n doesn't talk about addiction, and that's where treatment becomes very necessary. And it is the addicted population that uses the majority of the drugs and keeps fueling that pipeline. When you go to the section on goals for the national strategy, which is Appendix D, and look at what the goals are, there are no articulated goals in the national strategy that relate directly to treatment. They relate to high school use, they relate, relate to use in households, and we know these are the two least at-risk populations that we can survey. Why the omission? I don't know that. There is great precedent in the national strategies of the 60s, 70s and the 80s, early 80s, where treatment was discussed. I don't know why the omission as we get in the late 80s and here in the 90s. And I have not heard... Well, maybe it's because treatment doesn't work. But what I'm saying is that's a myth, and, the, and, and maybe we need to educate the people well, who write the strategy. Well, if you're looking for some suggested answers, I'm going to give you some. Okay. I mean, if you, you come here and not, you know, you're the experts, right? Well, but I can't. The first you, thing you do out of the box is ask me a question that you don't know the answer to. I, I cannot explain why Director Bennett and Dr. Kleber and their staffs did not address treatment within the context of a national strategy. And, and, and putting that question to them, I have not received a satisfactory answer. That, that's what I want to point out in, in terms of the strategy. The national priorities in terms of uh, treatment are not articulated. There's no discussion of treatment on demand, although the Congress in Public Law 10690 made that a part of national policy. And that law passed just about the time uh, before the strategies were written, and that's never been addressed in, in either strategy one or strategy two. I, in the 70s, we took that as a national priority. We made it work, and it made a difference on the number of addicts that we had, and made a difference on crime rates, and there's data from the District of Columbia, there's data from the City of New York that will support that. I think that one of the uh, other uh, issues about the national strategy, which the mayor made a major point of, is the matter of balance. There is, an, uh, at the federal level, simply an over-reliance on interdiction and enforcement. And that reliance goes back several years, and every time it didn't work, the answer was, let's do more of it. And this was pointed out this was discussed in the debate or around uh, Public Law 10690. It was dis discussed and debated after Strategy 1, and the budget that supports Strategy 2 made a 1% shift in allocation to law enforcement and interdiction. So apparently that message does not get through uh, to the uh, people who are in charge of trying to set the federal uh, priorities. Now, it's important to note that when you get to the treatment area, the federal government is today a, not a minor player, but certainly a much less significant player than the states and local governments. Uh, a survey taken last year by the state director showed that state and local governments support 57 percent of all the expense to support publicly funded treatment and that the federal government supports 23 percent, and only about 17 of that came out of the block grant. There are other areas. So I think it's, when you, when you look at what should be a proper federal role of leadership, at least in the treatment area, concentrating on that area, the federal government has not shown itself willing to go online for that service. 
there are improvements. I think that we are all pleased with the increases, particularly that were uh, put into the budget last year with the Congress. We are pleased with some of the increases that are uh, proposed in prevention and education this year. The, pro the increase in treatment of $100 million, which is referred to in, in the uh, strategy, when put against an enterprise of public funding that exceeds $2 billion, does not become a major thrust for improving the capacity of communities to treat addicts. And if we're going to solve the multitude of problems associated with drug abuse and addiction, we're going to have to come to grips with the issue of treatment, because without it, we're just going to continue to flounder. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Newman, you've uh, bought and written and uh, been the head and is still is of a very large medical center in New York. We'd be very grateful for your observations this morning. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my comments uh, will address the question of effectiveness of treatment and specifically methadone treatment. Uh, and I can save any suspense by saying at the outset it is a very, very good news story. It is a spectacular story and it's particularly dramatic because, because it comes at a time when there is unprecedented gloom and a feeling of frustration and a feeling of anger and, as Mayor Good uh, mentioned in his testimony, uh, a feeling of resignation, let's throw in the towel. It's at this moment that the news with regard to methadone effectiveness is particularly uh, dramatic. I'm not suggesting that methadone treatment or any other single approach to the problem of drug addiction can by itself form a simple, easy solution to this problem. The problem is far too complex and it exists on far too great uh, a magnitude to allow simple solutions. In one of the New York papers uh, this morning there was reference to uh, the seizure in 1989 of 89 tons, 89 tons of cocaine during the past 12 months, and according to the article, it has had zero impact on the price or the availability of cocaine in New York City. So for sure there are no easy solutions. On the other hand, we should be able to identify and build upon the successes that we have. Um, Karen, can I have the uh, first poster? Uh, there have been a multitude of studies <clears throat> with regard to methadone treatment over the past 20, 25 years. Many of them have been published in professional literature and have emanated from the programs themselves. These data that I'm going to uh, share with you this morning are entirely data that were collected by or on behalf of the federal government. These are two, uh, two statistics that were released by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. They reflect studies which were commissioned by the National Institute. I think they're truly phenomenal. As you can see, within weeks, within weeks of enrollment in methadone maintenance treatment, 66 to 80 percent reduction in illicit opiate use. The, these are outpatients who continue to live in their communities, who continue to be plagued by the social problems, the family problems, all of the difficulties that exist in their communities, and yet within weeks of enrollment, 66 to 80 percent reduction in illicit uh, opiate use. The second statistic is also particularly impressive because it refers to cocaine use by heroin users before treatment and the impact on cocaine use following enrollment in methadone treatment, even though methadone pharmacologically does not affect cocaine uh, usage. And as you can see, according to the NIDA-supported study, 60% of those people who before enrollment, alongside their heroin, were regular users of, co of cocaine, 60% stop after enrollment. The, they, they stopped cocaine or heroin? No, the second statistic refers to the cocaine use, which stopped in 60% of regular users before admission. These are heroin addicts who also regularly use cocaine, the first statistic refers to right. heroin. That are, you, are you suggesting that methadone was used to stop cocaine abuse? Cocaine abuse in a heroin-addicted population, a heroin-addicted population which before enrollment regularly, not intermittently, but regularly also used cocaine. 
Methadone treatment is not, is not a pharmacological medication useful for cocaine abuse per se. But when we treat heroin users who also are using cocaine, even though pharmacologically there is no impact on cocaine, the results, as reported in this NIDA study, is that the cocaine use also, to a dramatic extent, re is reduced in this heroin-addicted population. But I have additional statistics that will elaborate this even further. Um, very recently, as a matter of fact, within the past three or four weeks, a report was issued by the General Accounting Office, which I understand is the investigative arm of the Congress of the United States and obviously one of the most objective, accurate sources of data one can imagine in this country. The GAO uh, in March issued a release, and these are GAO findings based on a one-and-a-half-year study, obviously a very thorough study, of methadone programs throughout the United States, 24 separate programs in cities from coast to coast. And the GAO findings are that methadone stops heroin use, stops heroin use within six months of enrollment in about 85 percent of the entire patient population. And in New York City, and as a New Yorker, I take no pride in this, but clearly New York is the most drug-ravaged city in the entire country. In New York City, there were five programs, methadone programs studied, and in those five programs, GAO reported that 95 to 98 percent of these hardcore criminal long-term heroin addicts within six months of enrollment in methadone treatment had stopped, not reduced, GAO says they stopped heroin use. In addition, and this again relates to the cocaine problem, and I might say that in New York City for sure, we know that heroin addicts on the streets of our city, almost without exception, also use, generally use regularly, cocaine. So the heroin addict population is also a cocaine-using population. And even though methadone pharmacologically has no effect on cocaine use, once enrolled in a methadone maintenance program with the hope and the help that is provided as a result of that enrollment, GAO reports that 60 to 100 percent of the national sample are not using any cocaine within six months of enrollment. And in New York City, where again, cocaine use is almost universal, among the heroin addict population, 60 to 92 percent of the patients are not using cocaine within six months of enrollment. Now, what does this mean in terms of the impact on the overall drug problem? Could I have the final slide, please? Using GAO data, GAO indicates that there are roughly 100,000 former heroin addicts currently enrolled in methadone treatment programs throughout the United States. The 85 percent figure is the GAO finding with regard to the proportion that stop, not reduce, but stop using heroin. If one assumes that the average cost of heroin spent by the addict to the street seller, not the amount stolen to support the habit, which is many times greater, but if one assumes $150 a day average cost of heroin per addict, the one number that certainly can't be quarreled with is 365 days a year, we come out with the phenomenal, and I say that as somebody who for the last 20 years has been an ardent supporter of methadone treatment, the phenomenal conclusion is that close to $5 billion in street purchases and therefore street sales of heroin are not occurring today because of methadone treatment availability. Now, I said this was a good news story, and I certainly think it is, the bad news is that this phenomenally effective GAO certified effective form of treatment is by far not available to all those who need it and who want it. GAO estimates that while there are about 100,000 former heroin addicts enrolled in methadone treatment, there are at least a half a million heroin addicts on the streets. Clearly many tens of thousands want, desperately need and according to these data, could enormously benefit from methadone treatment. And they wait, and as 
Mayor Good said they wait and they wait and they wait because treatment is not available. Just to give you an idea of the dimensions, in New York City, the state drug abuse service states that there are 270 vacant positions in methadone treatment programs in the entire city of New York. as 1% vacancy rate. The same state agency also estimates that there are over 200,000 IV heroin addicts on the streets of New York City today. 200,000 potential patients for this extraordinarily effective treatment where at the moment there are 270 vacant positions. Uh, just to end on a very positive note again, what can be done is enormous and we should not be overwhelmed by the dimensions of the problems and the obstacles to overcoming those problems. What we know is that 20 years ago in New York City alone, the number of treatment slots increased from 10,000 to over 50,000. That's methadone maintenance and drug-free programs. Two-year period, more than 40,000 new treatment slots in New York City alone. Clearly, we are no poorer, we are no dumber, we are no less competent, and I hope we are no less committed today in 1990, at least for starters, to repeat what we accomplished in 1970. And I urge that this committee use all of its influence to ensure that Mayor Good's recommendation, which is so strongly, unequivocally supported by these GAO data, is accepted and that every single addict who wants treatment can get it on request immediately. I thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Newman. <clears throat> we turn now to the acting director of the Yale Substance Abuse Treatment Unit in New Haven, who is also chairman of the research in the American Academy of Psychiatrists and Alcoholic, Alcoholism and Addictions. Welcome, Dr. Costin. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you for this opportunity to speak with your subcommittee uh, about the National Drug Control Strategy. I'll be speaking both as a clinician and as a researcher, particularly focusing on the cocaine abuse problem. In New Haven, we now have about 1,000 patients in treatment on any one day, and yet in our reasonably recent estimates, only about 20 percent of the drug users are actually in treatment programs, so that there are long waiting lists for a number of our programs ranging from four to six months, methadone maintenance being one of the ones that develops the longest waiting lists. Certainly this is not peculiar to New Haven. Many other medium-sized cities in the United States also have this problem. The concept of treatment on demand and the elimination of waiting lists for treatment is certainly a laudable goal and it's, no one can argue with that. The difficulty with that is that there would have to be open treatment slots available in order for this to occur. For treatment on demand, you'd be looking at perhaps five times the amount of treatment that's now available. I'm not sure how realistic that really is. I'm also not sure how many of the patients that are in that 80 percent will actually come to treatment. So that in making projections of what treatment on demand really means, how much treatment do you need, that is not a very easy task to do and it's not easy to discover just how much money you're going to need to do that. I find then it's something that needs to be done, but I don't find that the proper calculations to decide just what that's going to cost us have been done yet. In general, though, pharmacotherapies have been quite effective, um, but we really have made very limited progress in pharmacotherapies. Pull up the mics, Dr. Costin, so we sure. can all hear you. Maybe it's, uh, can you hear me better now? Thank you. It sounds like I'm screaming here, but the, uh, <clears throat> try this one. Yeah, that works. Uh, yeah, now I can hear it. Thank you. As I've said, pharmacotherapies can be quite effective, but they're really in their infancy in terms of treating cocaine abuse. In terms of methadone, I, I can't emphasize enough, methadone is clearly better than needles and aids, and important work needs to be done in developing similarly efficacious pharmacotherapies for cocaine abuse. I think the data that was just presented around the effect of methadone on cocaine abusing opiate addicts is quite impressive. We don't have similarly impressive statistics on crack abusers, and I wish we could provide them. Certainly the proposed initiative for medication development that's being developed by Senator Biden is a major piece of legislation that I think deserves support. I think that the National Institute of Drug Abuse has developed the Medication Development Division, which is in fact a very good first step in us finally developing something that will be a useful pharmacological tool. 
This is not to say that the pharmacological tools are the only thing that we have. They often work in conjunction with psychotherapies and support is needed for both types of treatment and research is needed in both types of treatment. I therefore feel hopeful about new treatments. I feel hopeful about stemming the tide of casualties from, from severe cocaine and crack abuse. I think the data that has been cited about the high school seniors, about a decrease in an efficacy in high school prevention programs, I think that actually is good news and I think it's important because it's finally turned around the massive recruitment of our youth into drugs of abuse. I think it needs to be seen in the proper context, but that is quite positive. On the other hand, clearly the, the heavy abusers of cocaine are ravaging the cities of America at the moment. Um, as in previous drug epidemics, there's a latency be period between the recruitment of drug abusers and the casualties that you see. This latency can be as long as seven years, and I think what we're seeing now is the casualties that have accumulated in this delay between initiation of use and when we have to start treating the people that have got into difficulty with it. So that if we're now recruiting no new users into cocaine abuse, or if that number is dramatically decreasing, which is what the statistics indicate, that is extremely good news for us. I think also that research conducted over the last 20 years has provided us with hope and some weapons to fight this war on drugs. And I think without these weapons, we'd have no war on drugs at all. We'd simply have surrendered. We clearly need more treatments. We need better treatments. We need better educated people to provide these treatments. We need greater availability of these treatments to the minority patients who sometimes do not have the patience to wait on our waiting list, which are quite long. I think a first step is to upgrade clinical services within the existing treatment programs. The programs that now exist have a paucity of physicians that work in these treatment programs, very low salaries for the counselors, and very poor physical plants in which the treatment programs currently exist. These are major deterrents in improving the availability and quality of treatment for cocaine, crack, and other drug abusers. And it's also critical to restore the clinical treatment training dollars, which were taken away during the Reagan administration and need to be restored. None of us in the field are expecting miracles, particularly in battling cocaine abuse. But I think the next 10 years promises to be a very fruitful period in developing new treatments. And the major thing that I would like to see happen is that initiatives that start in the executive branch of the government can often only last as long as that administration is there. The Congress, on the other hand, has much more longevity. So that a 10-year commitment from the Congress to a war on drugs is a commitment that I think could stand. I think that a commitment from whatever administration is in office in the executive branch has a great difficulty in that way. And that policies change from administration to administration and sometimes within administrations. So I would very much like to see the legislature take this, run with it, and make it something that can be sustained over the next 10 years, because without a 10-year sustained effort, we're not going to make any impact on cocaine abuse treatments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Costin. Uh, <coughs> Dr. Stanley Wallach is director of the, uh, not only the, uh, or chairman of the board for life plans, which develops long-term care insurance programs, which is very critical. But he also directs the, the Beagle Institute for Health Policy uh, at Brandeis. And we would enjoy uh, your comments on the whole subject of uh, drug treatment, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would like to uh, make one clarification so I don't get misrep misrepresent myself or get charged with a malpractice suit, that I'm not a physician. Uh, I'm an economist. And uh, perhaps that's, as a member of the bad, of the dismal science, as a dismal scientist, I think I come mostly with bad news today because my conversation is mostly about what we know about costs. And I have had the opportunity of, in the last 20 years in health services research to testify before a number of congressional committees, often bringing better news with regards to what we know about costs and what we know about solutions. But I must say now that right now with regards to, to what we do know about costs with regard to drug abuse, we're probably 20 to 25 years away. We were in healthcare research. In other words, in the 19, late 1960s, 1970s, we started to ask the questions that we now need to ask about, about dr drug abuse uh, costs and treatment costs. We're a long way away, but I think the good news is we can make up time uh, this time rather fast because we have learned a lot about how to conduct this kind of research effectively. I want to really concentrate today on three points, uh, sort of what we know about aggregate, aggregate cost about, of drug abuse, and then go move on to treatment costs. And finally, I hope to talk to them here today a little about how we can learn fast the kinds, of, the kinds of policy and the kinds of management issues which this committee is faced with. I think there are ways to do that, and therefore most of my comments today will concentrate 
on that last point. Perhaps the good news with regards to costs is that there's very little. So, I, so having 10 minutes in front of you will probably give me enough time to cover it all. Um, I would really like to refer in my testimony to two tables in, in this discussion. The first table in the back of my testimony is Table 1, which shows the, sort of the latest data, published data, we have on the cost of drug abuse to society. The data refers to 1980. I think that's telling in and of itself, although it does inflate the data up to 1983 or 84. Of the total costs that are described there, about 60 billion, about 2 billion of those costs are regarding, with regards to treatment. So roughly 3% of the cost to society from drug abuse is really, is really spent on treatment. If you compare the cost of treatment and drug abuse to the total cost of health care in a comparable time period, 1983, we were probably spending 1% of our health care dollars, our health care expenditures, on drug abuse treatment. So we were, certainly weren't spending an awful lot of money. The last point I'd like to make with regard to that total table is that the bulk of the costs are really the cost of society, from crime, from lost productivity, from mortality. Those numbers are, are subjective. They're going to be, there will be debate on those numbers. But I think the important point, whether they increase or decrease those other those subjective estimates, is that treatment costs are a relatively small proportion of what, we, of what we are now paying for in this country with regards to drug abuse. Let me now turn to the second issue, which is treatment. Now, in the 1980s, and a lot of the data we have is very skimpy since 1980, there has been a significant growth in the private, in the private sector, particularly private insurance. Most firms that offer insurance today are also covering treatment for drug abuse. So you, your bulk of our workers today are now covered. Still, if you looked at, uh, at treatment costs and you looked at private insurance, the portion of the bill paid probably of, of drug treatment costs to total health insurance payments, I'm sure is less than 5 percent, and it probably is 2 or 3 percent. So once again, we are not spending a great deal of money with regards to drug treatment, even in the private sector. The other table I provided in my testimony, Table 2, provides some data from 1987 from the National Survey of Treatment Units. This data shows here in 1987 we were roughly spending $1.3 billion. Let me make three comments about the data in that table. First of all, you'll see that there's a large, there's a large number now for the private market. It counts, in fact, for about 40 percent of the private insurance, private payments of actually the expenditures now for drug abuse treatment. Secondly, I want to comment that a lot of this is self-reported data for, from units of, that treat people for drug abuse. And as such, there's an awful lot of non-reporting, there's under-reporting, there are certain treatment units that aren't reported. I don't want to go on with all the problems of the data. It's the best we have. But let me say, even if we increased, even if we doubled the amount of the, the cost there that's shown, the 1.3, and it went to $2.5 billion, that would still represent probably less than 1% of what we're spending in health services dollars in this country right now. So again, on a relative basis, we are really not spending very much. Let me now turn to the cost of treatment. And here we really have to use very aggregate data from this national survey. And what the aggregate data shows you, and it doesn't, doesn't differentiate between the type of treatment, the modality, whether it's residential, whether it's methadone, is that the average treatment is about, in 1987, was about $1,700. Now, if you assume that each of these treatment modalities has about two point, uh, this is treatment per client. If each, of these, if each of these treatment modalities has about two and a half clients, then the average cost of treatment for someone in drug abuse, maybe $4,000, $4,500, maybe $5,000 today. But that number is not a very good number at all because there's tremendous differences between treating somebody in a hospital, treating somebody in a residential community, treating somebody in an outpatient basis. And we don't have the data to really separate that and give you that kind of information. And we need data not only, not only what it costs per day or per visit, we also need data on the length, on the length of the treatment. When you look at cost per day, important information will be, is it an inpatient or a residential? Is it an outpatient? Are you paying for them on board? Uh, questions will be, who is providing the services? So cost per day is very important. But just as important is the length of time that someone's being treated. Let me just give you a brief example. If the hospital cost today were $300 a day, but if someone spent 14 days in a hospital, the total cost would maybe be $4,000. In a residential treatment program that costs $40 a day, but if someone was there for half a year, the cost would be $6,500 or $7,000. We need to understand the components behind the cost per day and the length of treatment. And to understand the length of treatment, we're going to have to understand therapies that are provided as well as the client characteristics. Now, I, I am not, as I said, a therapist, but I have read the literature, and clearly there's evidence that treatment works. And I think there's a lot of variation in those findings, but we need now to spend a lot of time 
understanding it, but we also need now to spend some time understanding, I think, the cost of that treatment. Let me first of all say that we can't use existing data. It's old data, and it really doesn't give you the kind of detail that you need. It's often based on, on accounting data. By that I meant it looks at, and it's, maybe it was the GAO studies, maybe it was another study, looked at, we paid, this, we paid the state or we paid these facilities X number of dollars, did they spend it? It really didn't provide the level of detail, the patient level of detail or the level of detail on how in fact those dollars were spent. So it really wasn't very useful for the kinds of questions that I think this committee and other committees in Congress are going to have to ask. I think there are three questions that you will all be asking if we track health services research in this country and the questions that Congress asked or people in the, or that executives in the private sector asked when they looked at this field. The first question is clearly one of information. First questions deal with how much. You will then turn on to questions of why. What, what, are those, what causes those differences in costs? And finally, you're going to be very concerned with the questions, really, to whom? To whom? How, does, how does those costs differentiate by patient characteristics? Now, to answer the first question, the how much, it seems to me we've got to start to get below the aggregate data of just what it costs on an average treatment and start to ask questions with regards to the cost questions, with regards to facility, with regards to services, with regards to personnel. We've got to ask questions with regards to treatment and utilization. What does it cost per treatment slot? How many days or how many visits does someone have? And what, is that, what does it look like for a whole episode? We have to gather information on a facility basis in a much more appropriate way. We also have to start to gain information on a client basis. This can be done through household surveys, or it can actually be done by looking at the treatment paths of people in various treatment uh, modalities. The second set of questions you're going to ask yourself is why. And I think we've already talked about that today. And you've asked a number of questions to, previous, to, to the mayor. Which treatment, which, where should we invest our dollars? Which treatment modality should, should we invest our dollars in? You're going to find huge variations in the costs between an inpatient treatment and an outpatient treatment. You're going to have to understand those differences because you're going to be making investments, whether it's through block grants, whether it's through general revenue sharing with some guidance, or whether it's categorical grants. You're going to be making key funding decisions that are going to guide this system. That's certainly been true in this country with our Medicare policies that guided hospitals, our Medicaid po policies that built nursing homes. The funding decisions you all make are going to guide the treatment modalities that we emphasize. And you're going to have to understand those, the what it goes on within those treatment modalities. And finally, as this committee deals with the populations it wants to serve, you're going to ask your questions about the cost to various populations. And there I think we're going to find what a lot of the research is trying to show, that who you serve makes a great deal of difference in the cost. Serving an employed individual is very different than serving a young, a young individual who's, who's well a job in the, in the inner city. And the characteristics of that population is very important. Let me make sort of one, two additional comments, if I may, sir. One is that, in fact, we're starting to learn this information. I'm glad to say that through our, our institute at Brandeis, through, through, some, uh, through a grant we've received uh, from NIDA, uh, and which is being supported by ONDCP, that we are now starting to actually do some of the, some of the, answer some of the questions of how much. We are now field testing an instrument that is actually going to gather on facility basis data by modality, by patient characteristic, and by service provider. Hopefully, when we come before you in a year from now, we'll be able to provide a lot more information. Let me conclude by saying that I'm very confident that if we're adequately funded in a very brief period of time, we can start to give you answers to your questions about, about how much. I think the, the other set of questions, though, about what should be harder, and they're ones that are going to take a lot of research and investigation about what really works, particularly as we start to deal with a complex problem like drug abuse and the populations that we, we, we are talking about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wallach, and I thank the entire panel. Uh, <clears throat> I have not heard enough, and I know it's been mentioned here, about the failure for us to adequately fund the research to determine what treatment modalities we should be using. Uh, it seemed to have been given a sort of a, oh yes, we don't have enough of that. Uh, here we are in a crack cocaine epidemic, and the fact of the matter is, and, and uh, we're trying to track this, and uh, Ted Weiss's subcommittee is, has been on this longer than any in the Congress, we're trying to find out why there isn't more money for the research that leads 
through the treatment modalities that are so desperately needed for crack cocaine. And I don't hear that enough from my expert panel. Uh, is there some reason why or, or should I be relaxed and uh, not get upset about that? Can you help me out, Mr. Bessman? I will try to speculate uh, at the risk of uh, wounding some of my colleagues, and that is that from the period of the passage of the block grant, which was 1981, until 1988, it was the position of the federal government that it was not responsible for this because treatment was a state issue. And if you l go back and go to NIDA and look at the rack of what they were funding, it wasn't until we get into a about to two and a half million dollars in 80, with the 86 drug initiative that they returned to looking at treatment. There was a burst of funding in the 70s when the federal government said treatment is our responsibility and we want it done right. And then there was this change of opinion and certain other things became uh, very much more a priority and those, but they flow from the policies and, and I'll put uh, there were two drug advisors to the president. One was Carlton Turner and the other was Dr. Mac McDonald. And they did not have treatment in any of their documents or their priorities as a priority. And that seeps down to what, how does an institute behave? I'm glad to say that under the prodding of the Congress, more than anywhere else, that changed in 88. If, yes, if, Dr. Newman. If I might, Congressman, just uh, the the uh, need for balance between research into new approaches, better approaches, uh, and on the one hand, and doing what we know works today. I think Congress must have, and our national strategy must uh, incorporate a dual focus. As with any other disease, whether it's AIDS or cancer or hypertension or diabetes, one is constantly looking for better, newer, more effective ways of dealing with the problem. But and I really want to stress this. The people on the streets of our cities who have no treatment available whatsoever today, they simply cannot wait until this research, which should be supported, which should be pushed by this Congress, they cannot wait until that bears fruit. So while it is nice to say, well, we're going to focus on this priority and the other one, we're going to sort of make really decidedly a secondary issue, you can't afford to do that because the people who are dying can't afford for that to happen. We have to do what we know works today, and at the same time, we cannot be complacent and say, what works isn't so bad, we won't do research to find better ways to do it. We have to do both. Just several comments. First, I think with opiate addiction, we do have some good ideas what works. We do simply not have great ideas about what works with cocaine abuse. We've got some leads, we have some medications that may be useful. That takes a much bigger investment but I think there's been an interaction of a policy that made treatment not particularly important. It also meant that clinical researchers were not trained for a fairly prolonged period of time. And there's going to be a period of about five years to simply train clinical researchers to get clinical treatment research done. So you're going to make an investment today that you may not see a payoff next year in. And that, that kind of patience is, is very hard to convey, but that's exactly what's needed. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I, I can now see the emphasis, Mr. Bessman, that you placed on the uh, problem of the omission of a, of a treatment strategy as such. Now, Dr. Newman, we're using the same book, but we're reading from different pages here. Uh, GAO methadone maintenance. Some treatments are not effective greater federal oversight needed. We, we, we did use the same text, didn't we? Yes, we uh, certainly did, uh, Congressman, and you are correctly, uh, I've read the entire thing very carefully, as I'm sure you have, you're correctly reading the narrative interpretation summary by GAO of its data. I must say, if I were summarizing those data, I would have done it in a very different way. But the data, while one can interpret things a different way, these data, and I refer to the data on, the, on page 21, which list for every one of the 24 programs studied by GAO, 
the percentage of patients still using heroin or still using cocaine after six months, those data simply do not lend themselves to any interpretation other than that on balance methadone treatment is phenomenally effective. It is the most effective in the five New York City programs. It is a close second in the two New Jersey programs. It is not nearly as good an outcome in California with regard to heroin, but these results are spectacular. And why GAO summarized their data the way they did, I really don't know, but the data, one simply can't interpret it. I don't believe in any way other than to demonstrate phenomenal effectiveness of methadone maintenance treatment. Uh, are there federal treatment standards for methadone maintenance treatment programs? There are, in my estimation, the most rigid, detailed requirements imposed by the federal government and by state governments on how methadone maintenance programs should and must operate than exist in any other field of medicine. And indeed, we, and I speak for all programs throughout the country that provide methadone, are subject to repeated, frequent, in-depth surveys to ensure that well, we are meeting Well, at page them. four, there are no federal treatment standards for methadone maintenance treatment programs. Further, none of the programs we visited evaluated the effectiveness of their treatment. See chapter three and page 27. Now, the problem, of course, is that uh, Methadone is, uh, uh, is a drug itself. It's a medication, sir, yes, sir. Right, which creates its own dependency. Uh, sir, it's a, perhaps a semantic issue, but it's a very important one, and if I might just distinguish, it is a medication which reverses, obviously in a very large proportion of patients, <clears throat> reverses the devastating medical and social impact of heroin addiction. It is a medication which, like so many, cannot be abruptly discontinued without leading to side effects. In that sense, it okay, is... Okay, you're splitting it down the middle. Then. Isn't there a whole market out here in the, on the streets for methadone? There is indeed a black market for methadone, and there will continue to be a black market in methadone as long as the demand for legitimate treatment, which we know is life saving is not available to those who need it. The people that are buying it on the streets, you may know, are not buying it for treatment. Uh, sir, I disagree. I, I'm sorry, but I, I truly disagree. Uh, in my experience, going back many, many years... You don't think they're just buying it to get high? Absolutely not. Overwhelmingly... Well, I'm they, glad to learn that the, the, the drug addicts in our, on our streets now are so health-oriented that they're now buying... Instead of buying illegal drugs, they're buying health-providing drugs that the government won't provide them. Dr. Newman, give me a break. I mean, I didn't just start out here, and neither did you. Uh, we, we've, and I'm not here to knock methadone, but unless we put the whole story forward, you know, there will be people listening to you and me, and... Uh, They'll say, but wait a minute, I thought methadone was a drug. No, Dr. Newman said it wasn't. Wait a minute, I thought there was a market out on the street. Yes, he said it's a market, but they're doing it for treatment. Uh, they, they, the, the, they're doing, these are good guys buying and selling this stuff illegally. Uh, the doctor said that, uh, that there are federal treatment standards, but GAO said there weren't. So he's got all this good news, but it's got to be qualified. You've got to read the book, Why Did GAO Take Such a Hard Note? Why is Congressman Rangel, chairman of the, the Special Select Committee, uh, beating up on, on uh, the methadone treatment? And he was the one that requested the GAO report. So, you know, in the interests of... Uh, accuracy and understanding, we, we have to separate out some of this real good news and put it in, in perspective. And I, I am troubled by uh, 
by this success that you've seen, and I hope, I hope that at least most of it's correct, but at the same time, I've got to move in a, in a very real way. Now, I want you to have a chance to, to react to all of this before you leave, but I've got to ask Dr. Costin uh, a very fundamental question. You know, if you support Biden's program, why do you question the need for treatment on demand? I mean, what's the problem? That's what Biden calls for. He can't measure any more than you or I how many treatment slots specifically we're going to need. What, what difference does that make? We know we need several times more than we've got. Uh, I've never heard of the government putting out too much health prevention or too many treatment slots, so I'm, I'm not worried about us overshooting the mark anytime soon. Could you explain what, what appears to be uh, uh, remarks that don't parallel each other? Certainly. Uh, I think if the federal government has the $50 billion that they're going to bail out the savings and loan, it has an equivalent amount to put into drug abuse treatment so they can, in effect, make treatment available five times more than it is available now, including methadone maintenance, then perhaps those kinds of plans are, are reasonable. The issue is if the amount of dollars are limited, then the amounts of treatment that can be provided with the available dollars may not be optimal kinds of treatments by any stretch of the imagination. To take as an example the methadone maintenance one that you bring, methadone maintenance is an extremely efficacious treatment. Um, I've certainly differed from some of my colleagues around how that needs to be provided. I think diversion of methadone is a, is a, is a real concern needs to be provided in comprehensive programs. Comprehensive programs don't come cheap. And so you have to invest the money to make them work. Cocaine abuse pharmacotherapies, cocaine abuse treatments are going to be more expensive than methadone maintenance is. And so they're going to, it's going to cost a lot of money to do that. So if you're going to say that you're going to provide treatment on demand with $10 million or $10 billion, then the treatment that you're going to provide may in fact not be sufficient. And I'd prefer to see that the treatment that be provided be first-class treatment, treatment that's going to have good efficacy, treatment so when you do the outcome studies a year out, you're going to show that, yes, there is good efficacy for them. There is a risk of treatment on demand if you, in fact, have to get five times as much treatment as currently available. That treatment's not going to be as good as it needs to be. The existing treatments that we have right now need to be improved. They need better educated people in those programs. They need more physicians in those programs. They need to have better facilities in which they provide those treatments. So that's the first priority. That's, so it perhaps, yes, if you have unlimited resources to provide, by all means, treatment on demand, everybody who wants it, it's great. Thank you very much. John Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to just follow up directly on that. As I understand it, uh, uh, Dr. Costin, uh, you support the uh, uh, concept of central intake as a way of the scarce resources that we have uh, uh, more efficient in, in their application. Uh, correct. Does that tie in directly with the answer to the Chairman's question that you just gave? It does, in that the, the variety of treatments that are available in substance abuse are quite large. There are residential treatments, there's methadone maintenance, there's drug-free outpatient treatments, and one needs to decide when a patient comes into treatment what kind of treatment is most appropriate. Can they, in fact, be served by a short-term outpatient intervention that perhaps is only as long as five or six sessions? Do they need to be in residential treatment for two to five years? To make that decision, you need well-educated, well-prepared professionals to evaluate these patients when they come in and to triage patients to the most effective treatment. That kind of a centralized triaging process occurs in the best programs, certainly, in the country, but does not occur everywhere. And I think that's an important part of this. And, and so the idea here is, and uh, l let me just make it very clear, I doubt that any of us here would disagree with the proposition that more funds, local, state, private, federal, more funds need to be made available to fight this war if, uh, as Mayor Good said, this, we really are going to treat it as a war. Um, but given the difficulty in allocating as many res resources as we'd like, what you're saying is, at least as a first priority, uh, take what money we can and use it in a way that makes the system uh, most efficient to treat the most number of people in the smartest way. And Precisely. one of the first things you would do there is to spend some of that money right up front on this um, 
triaging kind of uh, program so that the uh, people that come into the program would be directed to the most beneficial treatment program for them, thus maximizing the use of those scarce resources that we're making available. What I'm saying is that we seem to have waiting lists, and to have people simply sitting on a waiting list without a comprehensive evaluation done is not, is not good in any stretch of the imagination. And prioritizing which patients are most in need of treatment for example, it was pointed out about the pregnant women, that they are a very high risk group where you're talking about two people who are at risk, the fetus and the mother. That's a very simple evaluation. That kind of person should come into a central triaging unit and should be immediately referred for treatment. On the other hand, if someone comes in, they have less motivation for treatment. They have, in fact, uh, little reason they're there because their probation officer sent them and that's the only reason they're there. One needs to think about how do you prioritize what kind of treatment you have. When you have limited resources, you have to prioritize. We've been doing that for years. I wish we didn't have the limited resources, but quite frankly, I don't see that just disappearing overnight. Do you think that this process could also help to um, identify those patients who might be able to afford some, at least, uh, some of their treatment? Certainly, and, that's uh, our and, experience and in New Haven. Private, private programs or other programs where they would be required to pay part of the cost? We have a central triaging unit like this in New Haven, and approximately half of the people have resources available to them that can be utilized in private facilities that they're simply not aware of sometimes. Uh, let me just uh, make a final uh, point and, and direct a question to uh, Mr. Bestman. I uh, was in Phoenix last weekend where, where I reside uh, with uh, Secretary Director Bennett. Uh, he spent two days there, and, and about half of that time was involved in uh, touring treatment facilities, talking to the people there, trying to find out what worked and what didn't work, and uh, actually sitting in uh, groups, as a matter of fact. I, I sat in a couple of different groups with him. He asked some great questions. Um, I, I, I want to understand clearly, you're not suggesting that, that Director Bennett lacks a commitment uh, in this area of treatment to uh, determining where best to allocate the, the dollars and, and how to find the solutions to the treatment problems, are you? I'm suggesting that he hasn't said that at all in the in the document. It's not, right, he may have the commitment, but let, the commitment and how he intends to carry it out is not in the document. All right, That's let me the ask problem. you now. This this is the National Drug Control Strategy put out yes. by the White House, put out by uh, Mr. with Mr. Bennett uh, as the prime author. Mm -hmm. In the table of contents, uh, the first item under national priorities is the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. The next item is drug treatment, and if you mm -hmm. turn to that page, mm -hmm. here it is: drug treatment. If That's you look at the budget, fully one-third of the funds are for prevention and treatment. And uh, if, if you look through the various things that he's suggesting here, it's just full of specific provisions for legislation and for concepts to, to get to the treatment problem as well as all, uh, all of the other. It is true, he says, this isn't the only answer, but there's certainly, uh, if, if you just leaf through here, for example, you get into all kinds of, uh, you get into, first of all, the block grant program, treatment demonstration programs, a drug impaired pregnancy uh, programs, Re research, we talked about research before. I mean, there are all kinds of things to address the problem. Maybe not with enough funding uh, in, in your view, but fully a third of the funding is going to this. I agree that he catalogs the activities of the federal government and does a couple of paragraphs on there, but no place in this chapter does he say, this is our goal, this is what we're trying to do, and this is how we intend to get there. And then you go to Appendix D in the same document where he sets forth quantified two and ten year objectives. And these are objectives he selected and his staff. These come from strategy one. And there's no objective around treatment. There are objectives around a lot of other things. And I'm saying treatment is too much an integral part of the solutions to the problems of drug abuse to be omitted from having quantified goals and having explicit strategies within not just a description, these are process descriptions of what the federal administration the, the, in, hopes to do in the next year, but they are not an articulated solution to the problems of drug abuse or the structuring of a national treatment system. And it's the weakest part of his document. I'm not saying he's not personally committed. I'm saying this is the weakest part of the document and as someone who started treating heroin addicts in 1957, there is 30 plus years of experience and data, and there's the 1970s where we did 
buy up all the expansion, all the, the waiting lists in two years, as Dr. Newman explained, and he doesn't tap any of those tactics or strategies or experience. I think this is an omission on his part. I would hope that in strategy two, three, it is corrected, and I put that before you in hope that it is corrected, not that I want to see it eliminated. Mr. President, I, I don't want to argue with it, but I'll just make this last point. One of the problems that Mayor Good identified, uh, for example, was the problem of, of developing mechanisms to assess the needs of treatment in different areas of the state and, and then to prioritize funds on that basis, to establish uh, criteria to understand really what works and therefore prioritize the funds for those purposes and so on. Those are just two of the six specific um, uh, purposes of the legislation mm -hmm. that is specifically recommended in this document by Secretary Bennett. The Congress hasn't adopted it yet and sent it on to the President for signature. But at least it was a very specific recommendation to solve very specific problems that yeah. people like Mayor Good identified. And, and, so and I don't see how, I, how you well, can say that he hasn't the, proposed the, specific solutions to specific problems that people on the front lines have demonstrated or, or, or have illustrated. But he, having a state plan is not going to put out treatment on demand when you back away from that as a commitment. There were state plans in Public Law 92-255. Let me just interrupt you for a second. Now, you're suggesting that this administration should have as a commitment a treatment on demand, and we've just heard testimony that there are some problems with, with viewing that as a realistic goal, at least in the short run. It, it is as realistic goal as it is to have treatment on demand when you fall off a curb and break your arm. We don't have a bit of problem if somebody breaks an arm and they go to an emergency room and even if they wait a few hours, they get their arm set. But can you imagine the outrage in this country if we sent people with fractures home and said, come back in four or five weeks and they could stay in the pain and turmoil because we don't have a treatment slot for you. And addiction is every bit as much a treatable disease as a fractured arm, but we are very comfortable in saying, well, that's, they, those people really don't deserve it. I will share with you a, a definition of drug addiction that was first discussed with me in the late 60s, and it was discussed with me with some of my um, former patients, and that is that drug addiction is the use of a drug I don't use by people I don't like. And we as a society don't come to grips with that enough. And, they, and, and that's why we hedge on every other, uh, diabetes, cancer, fractures, we say, my God, we need this, this capacity here. Addiction, we hedge. And I, I say, if you want to really address the problem of addiction, which is, which is core to all drug abuse and the massive social costs we think, then we should make that commitment. Do, it, do I say the administration or the Congress can deliver on that in the next year? No. I don't believe it's possible because I helped construct the system between the late 60s and the mid 70s and we were given five or six years to get the job done. But somebody's got to be committed to the journey, and I don't see that in this strategy, and that bothers me. We don't, I don't believe we disagree, except I want to see the commitment to that goal, and I will accept the doctor's uh, judgment that we're going to have problems getting there. But let's not be uncommitted. Mr. Bestman, I'm sure we all want to be committed to the eradication of this. I'm sure you would agree. The President, Mr. Bennett, agree with that proposal. I just think we should be positive and, uh, and uh, reinforcing of each other in this rather than being uh, what I would characterize as overly critical of, of the national drug strategy of Mr. Bennett. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Kyle. Mrs. Boxer, do you have any questions? Yes, I do. Um, the lady is recognized. Thank you. I just want to congratulate you, Mr. Bestman, and I hope you won't mind if I use your analogy as I discuss this issue, because you're so right. We would never stand for it if somebody had to wait for six months to get an arm set. And you know, it's not that different than, I did a radio interview after the Congress passed the child care bill, and uh, this um, person said, well, um, the administration is wondering how we're going to pay for this. How 
are we going to pay for this? And I said the same way we paid for the B-1 bomber and the MX missile and aid to the Contras. No one in this administration ever asks how when it comes to things they want to do. But when it comes to things they don't want to do, suddenly the question looms. It's impractical, it can't be done. I thought this was the country with the can-do attitude. So I really enjoyed very much your analogy. I think it is exactly on target. And I hope you won't mind if some of us pick it up and use it. Um, I want to talk about the methadone situation. I'm a little troubled by, by the little back and forth with the chairman. And I seem to remember in the 70s, I was in um, local government then, that that's when methadone clinics started. Am I correct in that, Dr. Newman? Started really in the uh, early 70s, late 60s and early right. 70s, yes. Now, I'm assuming that we have, I hope, studies that have tracked the people who went into those programs in the 70s. Now, are those people off of methadone now? Are they still on methadone? Are they back on heroin? And I don't mean everyone, but better than 60 percent or 50 percent? Uh, th there have been a number of studies regarding what the uh, uh, fate is, if you will, of people who leave treatment for whatever reason. Obviously those, not obviously, but as one might expect, those who have stayed in treatment longer, who have been more completely rehabilitated, have a better uh, result long term than those who leave against medical advice or are terminated for breaking the rules of the program or what have you. Uh, there is a difference of opinion within the treatment community, the methadone treatment community, whether detoxification from methadone as a medication should be a universally applied goal. I believe even the GAO in its narrative does refer to the fact that many treatment experts feel that this is a chronic recurring problem. My own view is analogous to that of Alcoholics Anonymous for whom I have the greatest respect, and whose philosophy I share in this regard. If you ask an AA advocate, when can somebody be declared cured of this problem of alcoholism, stop going to AA meetings, heaven forbid, perhaps have a glass of wine with dinner, the response is emphatically, never, ever, ever. The likelihood of recidivism, according to AA, is just as great after 30 years of total abstinence as it I is. I understand. Three. I'm, I'm, and, not, and I'm not asking you. Wait no. a minute. Let me just go back. Yep. Have Sorry. we followed the people who entered the program there have 20 been many years programs, ago? And yes. what, so what is the result? Okay. The, um, there are so many programs, it's tough to generalize. One very major study found that roughly one-third, roughly one-third of patients after methadone maintenance treatment continue, and I can't remember if it was three years or five years, of the heroin addicts no longer use crack, that's great. But on the other hand, 40% still do. And if, if you view that as a failure, then indeed, as Mr. Rangel views it, it's, it's a failure. Um, do we have any known <coughs> therapies for crack cocaine? I mean, is, it, there is no substitute medication for crack cocaine. Is that correct, Mr. There are, Dr. There are some medications that have been tried, but certainly nothing that has stood the test of time the way methadone maintenance has, and I believe that's where the need for additional research uh, has been appropriately emphasized. The drug-free programs do treat crack and cocaine use, and I believe they feel they have a very respectable level of effectiveness in doing so. Okay. Dr. Costin, if, if suddenly a miracle happened, and Dr. Bennett and Mr. Conyers got together and said, we're going to have treatment on demand for crack cocaine users. And suddenly there you were with whatever you needed, a blank check, to walk into a, a crack house and take these kids, these people, and do something with them. What would you do? What would be the first thing you did? Money's no object. Dr. Bennett has made this a model program. Mr. Conyers is on his board of directors, and you've got the money. Might what do you do? Uh, John Kyle on board, too, while and you're And we have it. John Kyle in there as an advisor to all. What would you do? The most effective intervention is moving people out of where they are. So you might move them to the middle of the Rocky Mountains so they don't have any exposure to drugs. And in fact, 
mean, it, um, it's a little facetious, so but would, it is no, serious. No, no, no. If you're I am saying if the sky was the limit, the, your first thing you would do is remove them from the environment in which they find themselves. When they're living in the middle of a ghetto where availability of cocaine is every place you turn, where in fact you've been exposed since you're 12 years old, the odds of making an intervention in that environment, pharmacological, psychotherapeutic, or whatever, that's going to change everything overnight is very <laughs> small. So that if you have unlimited funds, you need a broad social program, mm -hmm. which may include relocation of people. Yeah. I just want to go a little further with the crack cocaine, because now in San Francisco, we're beginning, and this is true of all the cities, we're beginning to see children enter into the public school system whose mothers were addicted to crack cocaine, and these children have severe problems. And you know, when you start talking about dollars, as many of my colleagues rightly do, it's really tough to measure what it's going to cost to educate a child who has no span of attention, who's acting out, who's got real problems. So, and you pointed out yourself, this is a definite priority. Um, how can we reach the pregnant women to get them into these programs? What, what could we be doing now? Because this is a very costly problem. And second question is, how much research is being done to understand what happens to the brains of these kids whose mothers were on crack cocaine when they were pregnant? How much research is being done on that, if you know? And, and what, what can we do immediately to reach out to these pregnant women to get them into prenatal care? To begin with a question that I don't know the answer to, uh, how much research is being done is best addressed to Representative National Institute of Drug Abuse, who could give you the specifics on that. Dr. Wallach, do you know anything about what percentage of our budget is being used to study the effects of crack cocaine on children? You don't know? Are we doing any? We are certainly doing some, I can tell you that, including studies in New Haven itself. There are at least six sites I'm aware of in the United States that are doing research on the effects of cocaine on pregnant women and on their fetuses and their children. So there well, are, don't you I don't think this is a crisis, Dr. I Costin? Think that an does. absolute crisis? Uh, it, there's no denying that. It's quite does clear. Does Dr. Bennett mention it, Mr. Bessman, in his strategies? How to intervene with the pregnant? No, he doesn't mention how. He mentions it as a high risk population of which there's special uh, response. Dr. Newman, did you want to? If I might say, there's an even more urgent crisis, and that is uh, in most programs, most addiction treatment programs in New York and across the country, as a matter of policy, pregnant women are not accepted for good reason, given, and that is one really doesn't have the resources, one can't. But the fact of the matter is, if you're a woman who's pregnant in New York City or in Miami or in other cities, and you seek treatment and they know that you are pregnant, you cannot get treatment. That's a crisis which is even more uh, critical, I believe. I understand this will be taken up on the next panel. I have one last question. Dr. Welk, I tried to follow you as best I could and I had a, t a difficult time. And I want to just see that I understand what you told us. You, did you say that we're spending 3% of our research budget on drug research, or did you say 3% of the drug money? I, I was okay, not I'm sorry. following. I, I, I referred you to tables. because I, I, I know, but don't forget the tables. What How much made, are What I referred you to was the fact, if you look at the total cost of society and looks at, look at the cost of drug crime, uh, mortality, morbidity, we're spending a relative, and look at the cost of treatment. We're spending only 3% of our dollars we spend on drug abuse is spent on treatment. Okay, that's what I want to know. We're spending 3% of our drug abuse dollars on treatment, taking uh, into account... Of the cost of society. If you look at the cost of society of drug abuse, okay. it's in, 19, in the early 1980s, it was $60 billion. If you look at how many of those dollars were being spent on treatment, it was $2 billion. So it was, two, it was roughly, therefore, 3% uh, of our $60 billion was being spent on, in fact, treatment, services, research, a very small percentage. What I was trying to get at was if you look at the total cost of society of what drug abuse is, a relatively small percentage is going to treatment. I, made the, I then jumped to something else, which may have confused you, that if you look at the treatment dollars, the total treatment dollars, uh, services dollars, we now spend in health care in the United States for hospital care, for medical care, a whole range of things, 
that that the amount we're spending, that couple of billion dollars in, in terms of drug abuse, is a rel is a very small percentage of the total okay. expenditures. I made the statement less no, than I think one it's percent. A very, very less than one percent. With the chairman's permission, I just had one more question about the methadone uh, issue. Um, if you would allow me to do that. Um, I understand the administration, our staff has told us, is considering a proposal to expand the number of methadone maintenance programs. Clinics would be allowed to dispense methadone to addicts without having to provide vocational or educational services or any counseling beyond advice on how to avoid becoming infected with AIDS. Addicts would not be required to undergo periodic urine tests to check if they were still injecting heroin. Um, I wonder, Dr. Newman, since you are so enthusiastic about the methadone programs as they are today, would you be enthusiastic about that type of expansion, or do you think it would worsen the statistics that you're proud of today if you, in fact, just made it a dispensing program as opposed to all the other things that go along with it? I would be vigorously opposed to any suggestion that we replace the concept or the practice of comprehensive treatment by this so-called interim treatment. On the other hand, until and unless comprehensive treatment programs can be expanded as a temporary alternative to forcing people who apply for treatment back to the streets to shoot dope, I am enthusiastically in favor of anything that allows us, the programs, not to tell applicants for treatment, gee, I'm sorry, try to survive sticking needles in your arms three or four or five times a day until there's room. And let me just say that the proposal... So, so in other words, you would prefer to say to the people who are currently on your waiting list, just come in and get your drugs and leave, rather than not be part of the program. You I think it would work? You think that would work? The, the question is, is it going to be better for the individual and the society than having those same people continue to shoot dope on the streets? I think anyone who says that this limited, limited treatment resource would be worse, worse than telling people to continue to shoot dope, I, I just don't understand them. The proposal would limit this form of treatment exclusively to those individuals who have applied for a comprehensive treatment are on a waiting list for comprehensive treatment, and the proposal would require that it be terminated the day comprehensive treatment is available. How anyone could say, no, it's, it's better that they go back to the streets and shoot dope, it's not that I disagree, I just can't comprehend it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. English, do you have any questions? Yes, indeed, Mr. Chairman. Well, the gentleman is recognized. I appreciate that. Mr. Bestman, with regard to uh, the people of, who are using drugs, what percentage of drug users are actually dependent on drugs? Are actually dependent on drugs? Mm -hmm. Nobody knows the exact percent, and it varies depending on what the drug of choice is. Overall estimate? Uh, it would probably be at a, at a low end of 5% uh, and I would say at a high end of about 30%, varying with drugs. So 5 to 30% of people who use drugs are actually drug dependent, is that correct? Well, it varies, I mean, we'd have, the, uh, yeah, uh, I will, yeah, fine. Okay. Of uh, those people who, uh, uh, with regard to the, uh, the program. Mr. Kyle uh, referred to uh, Mr. Bennett's proposals. Uh, are those oriented toward the people who are actually drug dependent or are those programs oriented toward the people who are drug users? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. English, I don't know just which program you're referring I'm to. I'm talking to the President's uh, proposal that, uh, that came out last year that Mr. Bennett uh, authored, Mr. Kyle was referring to. If, if I look at his goals in the appendix, which tells me where is he going, then he is much more concerned with changing the drug taking of people who are not dependent, because there's no discussion of people who are addicted and dependent. So we should distinguish then between those people who are non-dependent drug users as opposed to those people who are drug dependent drug well, users. Well, I would say that people who are non-dependent drug users are not the people who are likely to show up at a treatment agency, and treatment is more 
by about 99.9% going to get people who are already dependent. And that's why I make the distinction. So the others are the ones that we normally would call casual users? We, we, they're users, they're periodic abusers. They are not yet uh, dependent and addicted and totally out of control of their consumption patterns. And therefore, there's a lot of other social, cultural, family, legal interventions that impacts on their behavior. But as far as cost to society, uh, I mentioned earlier roughly half, I think, of the law enforcement people, roughly half of the, the people who are convicted of crimes uh, that will see those crimes be drug related. Mm -hmm. Are those likely to come from that uh, uh, so-called casual user or are these likely to be the people who are drug dependent? I don't have any direct data on that. The data that comes out of the studies that Dr. Eric Wish has done for the Justice Department would seem to indicate that those people are, uh, and a high proportion of them are dependent. So we're talking about this 5 to 30 percent are the ones who are most likely to be involved in, uh, in uh, uh, the crime problem. that uh, They show up in our courts. They show up in our hospital emergency rooms. They show up in our treatment agencies. They show up on our welfare rolls. I mean, they consume enormous amounts of public energy and funds. Okay, that's the point that I was getting at, is that uh, th uh, the resources, the cost to society, whether we're talking about lo lost productivity, whether we're talking the loss as, as far as tax money going to prisons, uh, the, whole, the whole cost thing is likely to be bound up uh, primarily in this 5 to 30 percent of the drug users who are labeled as being drug dependent. I would, th I think the data shows that. Now, with regard to uh, the various programs that we have, uh, and, and certainly we have, uh, uh, as I understand it, with regard to drug treatment programs, that, uh, that at least the, the basic framework of a drug treatment program is very similar to the alcohol treatment program. You, you've got to have, first of all, a person who wants to be helped. That's the one you're most likely going to be able to help. Uh, you've got to be able to uh, deal with the people who are dependent not people who may go out and drink too much on New Year's Eve, but you're talking about the person who is drinking day in and day out and who is, in fact, dependent upon alcohol. Uh, is, that, is that correct, that correlation? That, the that, that's a fair comparison, yes. And, uh, and in that regard, then, uh, uh, what we're talking about when we provide treatment, we're talking about people who want help. Well, not entirely. The, it's... Very often, people need to have an interruption that makes them want. And sometimes that's a policeman collaring them. Sometimes that's a judge ordering them. Sometimes that's a wife throwing them out or an employer threatening unemployment. Uh, and sometimes it's uh, being incarcerated and having time to think in the solitude of a cell that I should be doing something about what keeps me in and out of here. In other uh, words, uh, uh, Dr. Coston was talking about uh, the change of environment. Uh, that uh, certainly is a change of environment. Uh, with regard to uh, relieving the cost to our society, having the greatest amount of impact, if you, if you will, uh, since it doesn't seem like we're getting too far looking at this in human terms and trying to deal with the human tragedy and the human problems, uh, perhaps uh, we might do better if we look at it from the cost overall of society, trying to remove uh, some of this cost, whether it be prisons or lost productivity, whatever it may be that, uh, uh, that uh, is generally uh, affecting us. Um, would it make sense, to, in your opinion, uh, to, or will we get the greatest amount of, of return for our investment, if you want to look at it as an investment, if, in fact, we target those people who uh, have been convicted of crimes and who are doing time in, uh, in prisons? I think that one of the great tragedies of our public policy has been our total neglect of the prisoner after he's convicted and it's cost us millions of dollars. Uh, in, in, in fact, the, it, just a piece of history. In 1929, the Congress passed a law to reform the, fener the federal prison system, and that created the first two treatment centers for heroin addiction. In 1966, the Congress passed the Narcotic Addict Rehabilitation Act 
began to reform that same system and put in a civil commitment to treat heroin addicts. This has been a nagging association for, you figure out the years, 50 years, and we still are avoiding it. So if we want to look at it from the standpoint of, of the greatest return for every tax dollar that we spend with regard to the drug problem on the treatment side, uh, that, uh, uh, and, and, and talking about the overall cost to society, uh, then it makes more sense to focus that attention on that individual who has been convicted of a crime and, and is incarcerated in a penal institution. Is that correct? I, I think it makes more sense to focus on, on two groups. One, the people who are running in your door saying, give me help, for whatever reason. And the second one, the person who is first arrest. There, I mean, we don't do any early we, we get somebody arrested for a drug offense first time around, and we do nothing. And we put them on probation, or, and we do nothing. And then they come back, and finally they wear the judge out, or the prosecutor, and they say, you're going to jail, and we do nothing. By the time he's in jail, we've missed about five opportunities to intervene. If I had to look at the criminal justice system, I'd get up on the arrest and pre-sentence and probation end to invest my money because I'm earliest in the process. I would not not do something in the prisons, but my priority would be on the head end of the process rather than after they've messed up four or five times to get jailed. Okay, and making an investment in, the, in those areas that you mentioned uh, and looking at the overall cost to society of this problem and, and all the, the related aspects of it. Um, how, does that, uh, how does that compare with making the investment on those, that other end? Uh, these people that, uh, that are not drug dependent, but who may be casual users who have not become drug dependent. Well, there's a lot of ways that I can influence the behavior of a casual user, and I think that here's an area where uh, the strategy discusses the, the uh, driver's license, uh, school uh, interventions, uh, certain privileges, you lose certain privileges if you're involved in your casual drug abuse. But as far as the cost of society, court systems, penal institutions, well, they're not yet in that. Uh, as far as making the investment where we're going to have the greatest benefit to society, say, forget the individual, where we're going to have the greatest benefit to society, where is that? I would say go where your casualties first arrive in the system because those are the people from that date forward that are going to collect social costs in the health system, social welfare, and in the criminal justice system just for starters. So you're talking about drug dependent people. Yeah. You're talking about investing in the 5 to 30 percent, not on that 95, yeah. 70 to 95 percent. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. That's Mr. my preference. Gentlemen, we're in your debt. This has been a a thorough but not exhaustive beginning, but we, we hope to enlist your cooperation as we continue to try to move forward in, in this very, very difficult area. We thank you for your cooperation and your preparation. We now have our final panel consisting of Dr. Dooley Wirth of the Montefiore Medical Center in New York, uh, the director of the Hutzel Recovery Center in Detroit, Ms. Beverly Chisholm, um, Ms. Katie Portis of the Women's Inc. of Dorchester in Massachusetts, and Audrey Martin, uh, also from the same area. Uh, <clears throat> we will, we don't know why the women's panel was last, and I think there ought to be an investigation of sexism conducted by the Committee. Mr. Kyle. That last comment, I, I need to apologize to these ladies because I have a 1230 appointment and I am not going to be able to stay for your testimony. I regret that very much. I will read your, your written testimony with interest and uh, would be pleased to get your views uh, on any other occasion. But I regret that I will not be here and I wanted to tell you that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Kyle. Uh, <clears throat> In a way, the last panel has heard not just the uh, formal presentations, but the discussion of everybody else. And that gives you a, an added advantage in terms of making your comments for the record. 
we, we're delighted that you're all here. Uh, and I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Wirth to begin our discussion. Okay, thank you, uh, committee chairman and committee members. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Um, I think that we have to be aware that what we are confronted with isn't strictly a drug problem, but the effects of the unraveling of our social safety net and the economic dislocation that's related to a shift in our economy from manufacturing to information and services, and also a supply-side approach to drug control. By focusing on drugs rather than examining why so many Americans feel that they need drugs to enhance their lives, we're pursuing ineffective approaches to solving the problem. We need to focus more on the process of addiction, the influences driving and sustaining it, and the efficacy of drug treatment. We tend to assume a heterogeneity in addicts which doesn't in fact exist. Drug-dependent women, for example, vary by age, race, ethnicity, class, and economic status. However, the context of their lives is radically different than that of drug-dependent men. This has very important implications for research, prevention, and drug treatment programs for women. Women are one of the fastest growing populations of individuals seeking drug treatment. The lack of knowledge about their pathways into addiction, the influences on their drug careers, their treatment options and outcomes is no longer acceptable. In the absence of knowledge, myths and misleading speculation have become a poor basis for policy decision making. One example is the current perception of female crack addicts. They're portrayed, and I think particularly in the media, as sex-crazed bingers, you know, on a run, on the mission, on the street. A less stereotypic picture is emerging from research being conducted in New York City by myself and several other people in San Francisco and in Liverpool, England. Apparently, there are groups of women who binge on crack and lose interest in anything else as a result, but they tend to do so in cyclical patterns, binging for a week or a month, then cutting back, then binging again. But more important than that, there are other women who are using crack in non-binging patterns, and they include co college students in California and older heroin addicts in the inner cities. The fact that they are using crack without necessarily binging raises the possibility that there are other factors involved in this behavior than the actual drug itself, and we need to look at what those other factors are. Our research also indicates that male sexual responses to crack often differ from female sexual responses, which are mostly negative. That is, that the women find crack cocaine a sexual inhibitor, that they do not want to have sex when they're on crack. They are doing it simply to obtain the drug. Another myth related to lack of knowledge about women in drug abuse is that they have poorer treatment outcomes than male drug abusers. There's no concrete evidence for this. There is evidence that many women, and in particular pregnant women, as you heard, cannot get into existing drug treatment programs, and that most drug treatment inadequately addresses the needs of drug-dependent women. There are complex reasons why women are becoming drug-dependent. They include social pressures such as divorce, the need for employment, and being a single head of household. These and other pressures are exacerbated by the fact that drug-dependent women are more severely socially stigmatized for their drug use than men are. Stigmatization and economic pressure create powerful obstacles to recruiting women into drug treatment. For drug-dependent males, one of the most potent motivators to enter treatment is the support of their female spouse or partner. Many drug-dependent women are in dysfunctional relationships with male addicts and encounter resistance from their partners who see their desire to enter treatment as threatening their drug habit, which the woman may be supporting, or their control over the relationship. Drug-dependent males also enter treatment in larger numbers because of trouble at work or with the court system. Women who have a higher rate of unemployment are more likely to be homemakers with dependent children, are less likely to be involved in crimes for which they are remanded by the courts. The primary motivation for most women to enter treatment is their children, the effect of their drug use on their ability to care for and nurture their children. However, the lack of child care in the majority of residential and for that matter, outpatient drug treatment programs means that women have to choose between becoming drug-free in the case of residential treatment and continuing to care for and nurture their, their children. Women who don't have friends and family members willing to help must give their children to the foster care system if they wish to enter residential treatment, and most women are unwilling to do that because of what happens to children in the system. Women also fear that they'll have problems regaining custody once they've been officially labeled a drug addict. 
While the lack of childcare is a primary obstacle to more women entering and staying in treatment, there are other institutional barriers, which include a lack of interest and commitment by authorities to provide appropriate drug treatment services for women, a lack of knowledge of the needs of drug-dependent women among service providers, and a lack of gender-appropriate staffing in co-ed drug treatment programs. More basic, but no less serious, are a lack of money to pay for treatment, a lack of information on existing treatment options, and a lack of transportation to and from treatment sites. Women who do attempt to enter treatment have many factors which contribute to poor outcomes for them. Admission requirements favor men. There's inadequate funding to plan, develop, and provide the mixed complex of services they need. And the inappropriate training of drug treatment personnel can, leads to continued insensitivity to women's needs. Other problems are related to the treatment approaches themselves such as the breaking down of ego defenses through verbal confrontation in co-ed programs. Most drug-dependent women are overly self-critical, have poor ego boundaries, often as a result of being sexually abused as children. We know that between 40 and 80 percent of all intravenous drug-using women are incest survivors or have been sexually abused as children, and many cope through mechanisms of learned helplessness with males. Such women need to be separated from men while going through treatment so that they can unlearn dependent coping patterns and interact with and learn to trust other women who will play a crucial role in the social networks needed to support their new lifestyles. Also, some women in co-ed drug treatment programs experience sexual harassment and are targets of transferred male anger towards their mothers, girlfriends, and wives, which further damages poor self-esteem and increases the chance that they'll leave treatment before completing the program. Once women have completed treatment, relapse prevention is threatened in various ways. Many women, as you've heard, still live in the same drug-dominated environments they came from. They often find there's no ongoing self-help support group which focuses on recovering women's issues. Many don't have meaningful social and economic roles as organizing principles for new lifestyles. Others lack adequate financial resources to meet their family's basic needs. And as treatment programs rarely address sexual problems, unresolved sexual issues, particularly incest and sexual abuse, impede women in establishing stable relationships, even though they may be sober. So the needs of drug-dependent women have been clearly defined. What we have to ask is why we only have 21 comprehensive treatment programs for women throughout the country. Why many are privately funded, can only take small numbers of women and children, and are chronically short of adequate funding. We have to ask why we're not funding what we know works. Even if we should decide to fund comprehensive programs to address women's issues, it will take time to implement them. More immediately, most inner-city drug-dependent women depend on Medicaid to pay for drug treatment. As many treatment programs do not take Medicaid, they and the women who do have no Medicaid have no access to any kind of drug treatment. If we're serious about helping women, funds should be made available so that women can shop the system, so they can look for the best services that currently exist. Funds should also be made available for treatment programs to offer supervised child care immediately. Such short-term approaches will not, however, address the needs of all drug-dependent women. Specifically, they don't address the needs of women who don't want to enter drug treatment. And we need to explore approaches to their problem. One approach is harm reduction. Harm reduction programs are based on the recognition that many drug users are committed to continuing their drug use, at least for the moment. And although abstinence is their ultimate goal, it is an approach to a series of harm reduction objectives which are based on providing user-friendly, confidential, free services to drug users, services designed to reduce the harm of their drug use to themselves, to others in the community. The contact that is established for the provision of these services is used to promote behavior change. In addition to looking at alternative approaches to working with addicts, we must address the needs of co communities that are beset with drug addiction. Addiction isn't an individual problem. It has to be solved at the community level. The federal government should make available funding for the problem to be attacked neighborhood by neighborhood as communities see fit. We need a multiplicity of programs, city, state, and federal, long and short term, symbolic and substantive that address all aspects of the drug problem, medical, social, economic, political, legal, and spiritual. Uh, I ask you to summarize, please. Yes, I just have one more paragraph. Um, we also need to appropriate more funding for research on what does and doesn't work on both w men and women, but on a community level. And the programs that the National Institute of Drug Abuse has for its AIDS demonstration projects have shown us how to reach into communities and learn what's working on the streets in the community. And they are losing their funding. And I'd just like to close by saying with the loss of funding 
for such programs, we lose a chance to learn what are more effective solutions. Thank you so much. Beverly Chisholm, uh, what do you think about what you've heard and how does it complement uh, what you're doing uh, in Detroit with the uh, Recovery Center for Women? What I think, what I know I've heard here today is a lot of statements that uh, we certainly share some commonalities that women, particularly in this country, uh, are in trouble in terms of accessing and being appropriately identified for treatment. Uh, that commonality, I'm uh, ashamed to admit, exists. That we should not have, um, women should not be the lowest of totem pole, uh, on the totem pole for services. Thank you. What else? Would you like for me to read my testimony? Well, you could summarize it. <coughs> well, basically what we're doing in Michigan uh, with the Eleanor Hustle Recovery Center is providing those services to the expectant addicted. We are taking women in, uh, which is unprecedented. There are, we are one of five treatment programs in this nation that accept pregnant women and women along with their children that receive simultaneous treatment. Uh, while we're treating these women, we're taking them, as I said, from a stage of pregnancy throughout what we call our recovery program. Technically, a woman could be with us for a period of two years if she completes all of treatment. We have removed a lot of the treatment barriers for women in the city of Detroit by accepting the specificity of a, a gender population such as women and children. Women more readily get to their denial issues because they are not encumbered by being in a co-ed program that was conducive to their usage. That's what we'd like to do, uh, in addition to what we already offer, which we call a holistic program, we are a medical model and we work from a disease concept. Because we are self-contained, we do keep women, we maintain them throughout the treatment stay. We don't have problems as much with recidivists because our system uh, allows us to, to treat holistically, looking at the medical, social, psychological, financial needs of this particular woman who has presented herself to treatment. We realize that being a family member, she is not just the one person who has a problem. We're talking about a familial problem and we do invite the family and significant others into treatment as well for individual and group sessions. So we're looking at treating the whole family. We're, in, we're into family unification and reunification. Uh, we are working steadfastly to maintain the family unit as we know it because what we're looking at now is a certain demise of the family. Is, is there a federal role in your uh, Hutzel Recovery Center? We are a grant funded program uh, through certainly the dollars are funneled down from the federal government to the state office. Uh, then to the city office, which finally the money gets to us. One of the issues is that the money is certainly given to the state. Uh, we are one program, as I said, one of five in the nation. We are considered the pioneers and the visionaries of women's treatment. Uh, we are called upon often to provide consulting uh, and ancillary services to other treatment providers so that they will understand the continuum of care that we provide. Our biggest problem is trying to maintain a line of treatment and also act as a resource for what has become a national base as of late. There is certainly a need for additional funding. I heard in a previous testimony that one of the steps that's necessary but is encumbering is that funnel, that, that trickle down effect uh, for the dollars. It is indeed possible that in the beginning of a grant year that the monies may be allocated in July. It may not be until August or September that those monies actually reach a program, uh, meaning that you have maybe one month to spend whatever that allocation may be. So one less step in the, fun the trickle-down effect and funneling of dollars would certainly assist us in providing more adequate care. Mm -hmm. That's very important. Uh, could I turn to Ms. Uh, Katie Portis of Women's Incorporated? and ask uh, for any observations that you may have about uh, the hearings and the testimony you've heard, and also to find out uh, in what ways you are similar to the Hutzel Recovery Center operation in Detroit and in what ways you may be different. 
Well, um, Women Incorporated was founded in 1972. Uh, we was one of four programs at that time that was funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse on a research and demonstration. Uh, to this day, I think we are the only one left. Um, and let me tell you that that struggle was real, just to hold on to that program. Uh, it was a, a three-year grant. By the time we got the program, what we considered was a program, it was time to look for funds again. The state did not accept us with open arms because they said they already had treatment and women don't stay in treatment. Uh, and one of the things that we was able to do uh, and on our surveys was to understand that women didn't stay in treatment because their children wasn't being taken care of. I know there's a myth that, that addicts don't care about their children. Sometimes that's the only thing they have to hold on to. Um, some of the things that I heard this morning, I, and I really just want to say that methadone is an addictive drug, um, that it is harder to get off than street heroin. Um, I am a recovering person some 20 years ago. Uh, and one of the, the, the myth that I bought into on the street from the street doctors with that methadone would help me. Uh, methadone did not help me. Uh, methadone hurt me. It took me about 30 days to withdraw from methadone. I had severe memory loss. Um, and that's very personal, and I don't know if that happened to other people, but I don't see it as a be all. I do see it as an instrument right now since we are confronted with the crisis of AIDS. <laughs> How many uh, women and children are able to be uh, kept at uh, Women's Incorporated, and, how, and what is your annual budget? Uh, right now, the budget is about $900,000. Um, we receive funds from the trickle-down theory through the block grant, uh, and we're also one of those programs that when it's time to cut back, we're the first one to get cut, along with the handicapped children and the blind children and the old folks. Uh, we're in that category. Uh, we also receive some funds from United Way. Um, women Ain't taught me a lot of things. I've become a professional fundraiser. Uh, and, and doing Women Ain't, I learned to beg for everything. And many times that took away from the things that I should have been doing um, and working with the women and doing outreach to those women. How many people uh, can be housed in your center? We started out with 12. We, right now we have 25 women and about 17 children. We had um, at least 13 babies last year, and we praise God that that was all drug free. Right now, none of them is testing positive, so we'll continue praying on that issue. Mm -hmm. Ms. Chisholm, what's the size of your facility in Detroit? Owner Hudson is geared to treat uh, 200 women at any given time and 20 children. Annually, we have contact with 3,500 women. Mm -hmm. And how many are housed in your, in your recovery center? In our domiciliary care facility that we opened in August of last year, 26 people, that's including women and children, can be housed there. And what is your budget? 1.7 million annually. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Miss Audrey Martin, we're glad that you're here today. Uh, what would you add to uh, the discussion that we've had about the importance of treatment in terms of a national drug strategy? Could Audrey just tell you who she is, where she came from, and where she's going? I think this is real, real important since we talked a lot about treatment don't work. Okay, let's, let's see if you can cover both of those mm -hmm. subjects. Well, I've been in recovery now for almost five years now. Um, I was incarcerated for eight and a half months due to my drug addiction. And let me go back to say that I come from a family of drug abusers. That includes mother, father, sisters, aunt, uncles. Um, it ran through my whole family. And um, I'm a mother of uh, five children. And I'd like to go on to say, after being incarcerated for five months, it gave me time to think what was going on with me. So I wrote Woman Inc. a letter and asked them to be accepted into their program, knowing that my reasons for going was to solely get my children back, because they were in the DSS department, I'm the state's custody. But once being there for a period of, say, a month and a half, I've gotten to see some things 
about myself that I didn't know. And um, being there, looking back now, a lot of layers of, I'm going to say skin, had to be uh, taking off of me because um, throughout all the years, uh, it was in the streets with my children. It was really, really hard. And I like to go back and say I used cocaine crack throughout all my pregnancies. And you know, people today say, you know, people ask me, well, do you, did you care? Of course I cared. I was addicted to cocaine, and that need for that drug was much greater than, you know, um, protecting my child because I knew the risks I, that I were taking. And um, like I said, being in Woman Incorporated gave me some time to look at myself and get to know who I was because I didn't know. And actually, I went into Woman Inc. in denial of the fact that I had five children. I was in total denial. And when that reality finally hit me, boy, was it a mind blower. But um, I've accepted that, that responsibility to move on. These five children of mine, I have to deal with that responsibility. But mind you, I didn't know anything about parenting, nothing, and all that. I had to be taught that while I was in woman. And thank God that these children had the opportunity to come into the house with me. Because I think if I had to deal with them straight on, just leaving Woman Inc. And, and, and straight on in the streets, I don't think I would have been able to handle it alone. Because I am a single parent still today. And um, the effect that it has, the drugs that it has on the, on the children, my oldest will be uh, 13 this year, my youngest is five. They were very angry children because they've seen a lot. So what we had to do was put them in support in supportive network systems so that they can get the support that they needed. Um, I am really proud of my children today because as long as I continue to educate myself, I was educating them. By them watching me today, I have an eight-year-old who has a job and, and that has done so much for him. And, and to say I, I work as an outreach worker, reaching um, prostitutes, um, pregnant women, and um, for my children seeing what the job, uh, holding a job for a little over two years now, <laughs> first job I ever had, and my children seeing this, it's done so much for them. It's like, like I said, and I strongly stand by, if you educate a woman, you educate a whole family, you know? And I stand by that because my children today, it's like they know how to tap into their feelings. I continuously stay with that. Um, they're doing very well in school. They interact very well with their peers. The anger that they had when I first went into treatment has died down. They trust me, you know, and um, they're able to share anything with me. And as far as educating them against, you know, I keep up front my past, especially with them, you know, and keep them educated so that they don't go the same road that I went through. And um, as far as drugs, they know drugs are bad. And as far as my 13-year-old today, gangs are stupid to him. You know, and um, I told my children just um, maybe a month ago that our job was funded for three years, and you know, it might be I might be laid off for a while, and that you know the sneakers and all that is going to stop. I actually walked in on them one day in the living room, and they were cutting out coupons. So th that's to give you a sense of what what goes on in my household today, you know, and. Um, install values in these children, you know? Because it's, it's, the, it's not their fault that they're here today. I mean, I 
Throughout my drug abuse, I had all these five children not knowing what I was, do what, what I was doing and no one being there to tell me what I was doing. And um, I can say I'm very proud of myself today, you know, and I'm just going to continue my day-to-day -day struggle because that's just what it is, a day-to-day -day struggle. Well, you seem to be gifted with a uh, powerful ability to withdraw from your experiences what you have to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, so important. Uh, everyone isn't able to do that. Some people can have experiences that don't, they don't have anything to reflect on or improve from. They just have experiences. Mm -hmm. Or maybe no one to teach them. Exactly. Yes, that, that's probably a, a large factor. Uh, I think both of them, though, coincide. Uh, some people get told the right thing to do all the time and they still do the wrong thing. Uh, some people, when they hear it and when they experience it, they're able to move out of it. And I don't know what the, uh, I don't know why that is, but I can tell that you're one of the latter uh, group and that's so very important. Do you remember when uh, the, the director of the uh, National Drug Strategy visited Women's Incorporated? Yes, I do. Uh, were you, you were there that day? I was day? there, yes. What did happen there? Nothing. Uh -huh. Well, how, how did this nothing take place? Can you give me a little bit more detail? I mean, when the most important issues was trying to be brought to, the, to this man. What, were, what like, were they? He was like about funding for more drug treatment program and he just completely closed down and was like, I'm not here to discuss this, you know. Well, did you have a chance to uh, uh, talk with him or ask any questions of him? Well, I had a chance to say a few things. But like I said, it was, um, I asked the question, what about more monies for more drug treatment program? And he was, he tried to ignore it, you know. He threatened to walk out. Exactly. Well, was, was the visit a successful one from his point of view or from your point of view? Was it a successful one? Yes. No. What do you think that it was intended to accomplish? Could you say that again? What do you think uh, the purpose of the visit was? So that he can keep up a front. He didn't seem sincere to me at all, at all. It was, he had to be there in front of all those cameras to put up a front. That's what I saw. Mm -hmm. Did uh, any of the other women uh, that are connected with Women's Incorporated discuss his visit with you after he had left? Mm-hmm. They felt the same way, that he didn't hear anything. I mean, a lot of women, he asked a lot of questions about, you know, how was a day-to-day, -day, how was a day a woman named as far as treatment was concerned? And these women were, were telling him, and, and, and as these women are talking, they felt like he wasn't listening. You know, so it was like the the visit there was it was a joke. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was a joke. Do you have anything to add, Miss Portis? I, I guess that <laughs> that the women that we work with uh, in our community is used to hype. We know what the struggle is. It's not a fashion. It's a lifestyle, and we accept that. And we understood that uh, with the drugs that are coming into. Roxbury, uh, that we were certainly hype, uh, that nothing happened, um, that we are still in the trenches and we will remain there because we refuse to surrender. Well, when and assuming that uh, Director Bennett uh, sees this hearing or hears about it, what advice can we give him since he's still the, the national director? Uh, how can we help him make his trips and visits, uh, which I understand there are plenty of. How can we make them more meaningful so that when he goes to places like yours, uh, he will be more effective? 
Uh, I, I think that coming in a little more quieter without all of the hoopla with the cameras uh, and really spend some quality time. Um, try to get to talk to us about what's going on in our community. Uh, the women that we work with uh, come from entire communities that are at risk for everything. Uh, drug abuse is the main issue that brings them into the program. But like Audrey said, when you pull the layers of skin off, you got yourself a problem there. But if you could just sit and, and get to know our community and know the issues that we're dealing with, he would be better able to go into other communities and be more healthy. Well, I thank you very much, and I hope that he will take your comments in the spirit that they are intended. Uh, do you have any closing comments, Ms. Chisholm, Dr. Wirth? I'd just like to say, um, in adjoining the statements that I've heard, that it would be important that the issue of treatment and its reality becomes known that it does work. If there is a population of people who are interested in those statistics, they need to talk to the people who have come from those trenches. They need to come in not with their personal agendas, but with the agenda of the recovery. And that's the statement. I think these people don't get heard often enough. I am ecstatically proud to be sitting here with a person who is five years into recovery. Where I come from, that's absolutely applaudable that we, when we hear that type of information, we stand up and give recognition to a person who, regardless of the odds, have overcome those odds and sit in front of a congressional subcommittee and says, I have recovered. It takes a lot of strength and a lot of will of character to do that. And that's the message that the United States needs to hear. I think you're so right. I just wanted to comment on the cocaine and methadone treatment question. In our methadone program in the South Bronx in New York, we are finding that women who come in who are heroin addicts tend to start using cocaine after they come into methadone mm -hmm. treatment. Mm -hmm. um, and also that 70% of our clients are heavy users of cocaine, which is a different statistic than you were hearing before. And about 75 to 80% of the women in our program are heavy users of cocaine. Um, the other thing was that there is a study being done in New York of impairment to children of uh, mothers who are using crack. And what it's showing so far is that there's more impairment through tobacco and alcohol use to, uh, to the fetus than there is from crack. Mm. It's important to note that in New York they have true methadone maintenance. People are maintained for life on methadone. To, you can't count those numbers in recovery. Mm -hmm. That person is artificially maintained. Yes. Right. Well, this has been a very important hearing, as you can understand that our focus was on treatment so that uh, we who are passing on national policy can see where we have to go from where we are. And you've certainly illuminated our course in a very, very important way, and I thank you very much for coming. This subcommittee hearing stands adjourned. If you would like more information about this hearing, you can contact the House Government Operations Subcommittee, located in room B373 of the Rayburn Office Building, Washington, D.C., and that zip code is 20515. And coming up next, here on C-SPAN 2, we bring you a briefing held yesterday by the U.S. Conference of Mayors. The topic, the 1990 Census. C-SPAN 2 programming information is available to our viewers 24 hours a day. For the latest schedule rundown, call 202 6